Well done. Good afternoon and welcome fellow councillors, officers and members of the public to South Kesteven District Council Planning Committee meeting on Thursday the 20th of January 2022. I'm not aware of a fire drill taking place today, but if so, the, uh, if the fire alarm does take uh, sound, then please vacate the building via the stairs. The meeting place is out the front of the building. Can please everyone ensure that they have their mobile phones turned off um, to silent, thank you. Um, please be aware that this meeting is being recorded and also being live streamed via YouTube. Could you ensure that your microphones are turned off when not speaking? I am Councillor Helen Crawford, the Chairman, and I'll be chairing this meeting today. And with me, I have as Vice Chairman, Councillor David Bellamy. Um, we also have with us Assisting Director of Planning, Emmy Whitaker, Principal Planning Officers, Chris Brown and Phil Jordan. Uh, Senior Planning Officer, Adam Murray and Ellie Siler, And Democratic Services, Alice Atkins. Public speakers, please be aware that you have three minutes to speak. You'll be advised that when you have 30 seconds left, you may finish your sentence, but not another paragraph. Um, and now we will go to all oh, before I start that bit going through the agenda. At the end of the official meeting, um, members, I'd like you to stay behind so we can go through some other paperwork. OK, lovely. Thank you. Yes, Councillor. Agenda item four, uh, the speakers are no longer uh, in attendance speaking against the application. The, the Paris Council. Right. Lovely, thank you very much for that information, Councillor Robbins. Um, so now we will go to um, agenda, agenda item one, which is apologies for absence. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillor Mrs Judy Smith, Councillor Robert Reid and Councillor Rosemary Cavey Brown. Councillor Gloria Johnson will be substituting for Councillor Mrs Judy Smith and Councillor Kathy Rice Oxley will be substituting for Councillor Rosemary Cavey Brown for this meeting only. I'll now take a register of attendance. Councillor Helen Crawford. Present. Councillor David Bellamy. Present. Councillor Harish Bisnalsi. Present, ma'am. Councillor Phil Dilks. Present, ma'am. Councillor Penny Mills. Present. Councillor Judy Stevens. Councillor Judy Stevens has given apologies. She's running slightly late. Thank you. Councillor Gloria Johnson. Present. Councillor Charmaine Morgan. Councillor Nick Robbins. Present. Councillor Penny Robbins. Present. Councillor Ian Selby. Present. Councillor Kathy Rice Oxley. Present. Councillor Jackie Smith. Present. Lovely, thank you very much. And we will go to item two disclosures of interest. Do I have any Councillor Selby, please? Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Although I have a brother that works at the college, I have no financial interest whatsoever, Madam Chairman. So therefore, I feel most comfortable to speak about on the item. Thank you. Lovely, thank you very much for that. If any other members um, remember anything that will come to light later on in the meeting, then please make us aware. Um, now I'll go to Councillor Bellamy for a list of speakers. Thank you. Uh, agenda item three, S210174. Speaking for the applicant or the applicant's agent, uh, Chris Dwan. Agenda item four, S21 stroke 1210, parish councillors, councillor Tracy Lamming. It's the applicant's agent speaking. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's just the parish. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I thought it was just the person speaking against. No, okay, don't. Just the parish councillors. So it's just them two. Right, okay. So Councillor Smith is speaking against. Well, it's not a councillor, it's Colin Smith. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, speaking against uh, Colin Smith. Uh, speaking for the applicant or the applicant's agent, John Roberts. Agenda item five, 
S210442, speaking against Michael Ellison, <clears throat> speaking for applicant or applicant's agent, Chris Lindley. Agenda item six, S21 stroke 2286, speaking against Stephen Holland and Mark Ward, and they're in reverse order. Thank you. Lovely, thank you very much for that, Councillor Bellamy. Uh, now we will go on to application, or item three, application, and that is being presented by Adam Murray. Thank you, Adam, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and good afternoon, members. Yes, this is application S210174. It is a reserved matters application dealing with matters relating to appearance, landscaping, layout, and scale for 480 residential units following the outline permission S153189. And this is for land to the north of Longcliffe Road and to the south of Belton Lane on the edge of Grantham. The application has been referred to committee due to it being a major application. So I'm sure members are probably fairly well aware of this site by now. Um, it is a site of a, around 37 hectares, around about 93 acres of land situated on the northern edge of Grantham, uh, adjoining to the Manthorpe estate to the south and Manthorpe village to the east. Just that shows a plan there, just showing it in terms of its broad context. Just zooming in then, uh, the site is bound by the East Coast main line running along the Western boundary, by the A607 and St. John the Evangelist Church along that Eastern boundary. The Northern boundary runs partly along Belton Lane and then cuts into the site and, and reaches level sort of where there's existing overhead power lines running across the site and follows that, that line down to the running furrows, um, which is running along here, where it then follows the line of the running furrows back towards the A607. Uh, it is a site that does have um, a, a, a fairly noticeable slope, given its edge of settlement position. Um, we have a high point sort of broadly in the, the centre of the site around here, which has been a, a key consideration sort of throughout throughout the, the, the assessment of the scheme at outline stage and then forms part of a key consideration as, as this scheme comes forward at reserve matters stage. Um, it's also important to note that the site's uh, in relatively close proximity to a number of designated heritage assets. So you've got Belton House and, and the registered parking garden and Belmont Tower situated off towards the northeast. Um, you've got Manthorpe Conservation Area, including the church itself, which is Grade 2 listed building. And in some respects, the site does also form part of the setting to St Wolfram's Church in Grantham, just in terms of that appreciation of the, the approach that you can get to, to the spire of St Wolfram's. Now, the current application deals with the central and western parts of the site, which are effectively covered by the outline plan permission. So that deals with the main residential parcels of the site and the streets and spaces sort of in between them. There, it also deals with the acoustic bund, which will be formed along the western boundary of the East Coast Main Line. There's a, remaining sort of elements of the built form, so the local centre, school site, etc., um, which you can see sort of here on the plan. They'll be sub subject to separate full applications in due course. Um, as I say, it's a, it's a site that I'm sure members are fairly well aware of now. It's a, a fairly protracted scheme that we've been, we've been dealing with here. Outline planning permission was granted on appeal for this site in January 2018, following a public inquiry. Um, that outline approval includes a number of conditions for future reserve matters applications, such as this one, which requires them to be in broad accordance with the principles that are included in the design and access statement, illustrative master plan and parameters plan submitted at the outline stage. And then also required um, plans to be in accordance with the design code and detailed master plan that was subsequently approved in July 2018. Um, so on the screen now just shows you the detailed master plan that forms that approved condition that the current reserve matters plan has to accord with as a, as a general principle. Key thing to note in terms of consideration of today's application 
is there is already an existing reserve matters permission in place for the site which deals with those same matters so appearance landscaping layout and scale which was approved by committee in april of last year um, that reserve matters application was subject to an independent design review that design review conducted by open who are now design midlands um, which identified a number of recommendations this approved layout effectively took on board some of those recommendations before them being determined and the current application effectively is now looking at taking on board further further moderate amendments to the scheme to take on board more of those recommendations from that design review as well as making sure that the scheme that is in front of us now responds to the actual site contours and those levels a bit more effectively um, so in terms of what the actual amendments are the committee report sets out in full all the all the detailed total changes that have been made but in terms of the key um, amendments for committee to note is the layout for the current application has essentially extended the approach to streets trees along the central east west running spine road um, so previously the street trees and the grass verge came in through the northern northern entrance and followed down that main spine road up to the local center that has now been extended along the remainder of that spine road up to the running furrows at this point here um, the layout for this phase three area here has been rationalized so it sort of effectively follows the, the contours of the site more appropriately so you've now got a more appropriate block network arrangement whereas previously it was a, a bit more of a, a a random network of streets so we say it's more of a uniform block network now there is also the addition of a permanent uh, vehicular bridge link across the running furrows so previously that had been approved as a construction access for this phase 1b element down here and was a permanent cycleway and pedestrian link and is now being upgraded to be a permanent vehicular link as well you have the addition of this terraced uh, crescent around this northern viewpoint, um, which is which has been implemented to try and reinforce views to the church spire of, of St. John the Evangelist in Manthorpe here and provide that reinforced view towards the direction of St. Wolfram's in Grantham along this viewpoint. You've got amendments then in terms of this eastern public open space here so that has been increased to, to respond to the, to the site levels a bit better um, but important to note in terms of whilst the current application deals with the, the noise bund along that western boundary those proposals remain exactly the same as previously approved under the, the former reserve matters consent so coming on to the the key matters for consideration for, for the current application as I say, outline plan and permission has already been granted for 480 dwellings on this site, so that principle of development has already been established. So essentially, the current application is assessed for the, for the extent to which it's in accordance with those approved design code and, and the master plan, those approved parameters plan, and in terms of its overall design quality. As I say, the existing reserve matters consent for the site does provide a, a valid and implementable fallback position. So it's only those elements that have been amended from that previous consent that can reasonably be used as part of the assessment for the current application. So where, where there's circumstances where the proposals rem remain the same as previously approved, they have effectively already been deemed as being appropriate by committee. So coming on to those, those, those key considerations, as I say, in terms of looking at overall design quality um, it is a situation where the applicant has effectively proactively looked to work with offices and consultees ref to refine the, the proposals throughout the lifetime application so it's been through iterations of design pad and then subsequent meetings then with principal urban design officer landscape consultee highways etc um, and there has been comments provided by the principal urban design officer included in the report and that in, in that in their opinion they are comfortable that it does perform positively against that building for health be life metric that is a nationally recognized standard for assessing design quality and again in terms of that fallback position provided by the reserve matter the existing reserve matters consent this application is considered to be an improved design quality compared to that previous permission in terms of the layout, um, the changes that have been made are considered to improve the actual overall permeability of the scheme, that inclusion of the vehicle 
connection across the running furrows is key to that. And the addition of that terrace crescent allows to reinforce those views towards the church, et cetera, make sure that the site does respond more appropriately to its actual site context as well. And then there's various amendments in terms of the actual house positions, et cetera, that have been detailed in the committee report, which trying to, to look at altering parking locations, et cetera, to try and reinforce an uncluttered street scene, more appropriate location for parking and bin collection points, et cetera. In terms of scale, the overall mix of housing types and sizes remains broadly the same as previously approved. And similar again, in terms of appearance, the use of building materials, et cetera, fairly similar to, to the previous approval. Um, as I say, the most notable change in terms of appearance is that addition of the running furrows bridge. Now, that bridge is designed to provide a single lane west-east connection, as well as a separated cyclone pedestrian connection. A uh, key thing to note with that is that the actual detailed design of that bridge link will have to go through the separate technical process with, with the county council, which, is, which will invariably have a, a major influence in terms of the actual structure itself and the appearance of that structure. So what we have in this case is there are conditions proposed for the final actual detailed appearance of, of that structure to be subject to approval by condition by, by ourselves as local planning authority. Um, but in any case, as part of the current application, the applicant has submitted indicative designs of what they would, would intend that the bridge design to look like. So we've got a, a, a visual image shown here, which shows it as a, a stone bridge with parapets and then a low level railing um, and then stone columns at either end. These proposals themselves have been amended following engagement between the applicant and the principal urban design officer. Um, the urban design officer wanted a, a sort of elegant arch feature. Um, I think there was, there was concerns effectively raised about if, if you're having an open arch, whether that would encourage access, which, which may then lead to antisocial behaviour, which is something that potentially we wouldn't want to be encouraging. So the compromise that we're, we've got reached here, which the, the urban design officer is, is more comfortable with now, is a, a distinct sort of stone bridge archway within a recessed bri brick arrangement just to provide that visual contrast without encouraging that that access that we that we wouldn't want to be wouldn't want to to, to have taken place um, in terms of the the landscape and proposals uh, it's important for members to be aware that in terms of landscaping we have the current application which deals with the on plot boundaries and treatments etc and the, the street trees etc um, the actual more strategic landscaping, so the, the design of the formal open spaces, the, the open space along the eastern boundary, um, that's subject to a separate reserve matters application, which will come to committee in due course. Uh, in terms of the arrangement for that landscaping, that's shown on this boundaries and landscaping plan. Now, the overall amount of open space shown, which, which is a matter, obviously, for consideration in terms of the layout, that is considered to meet the requirements of the section 106 that's in place for the site in terms of the actual overall open space requirements. Um, in terms of the actual amendments to the current application from the previous proposals, that extension of that tree lined approach, that's considered to be a significant overall improvement. The actual arrangement for the on plot boundaries and landscaping, that follows a three character type approach, which is reflected in the the house types on the site. So there is a cottage, uh, classic and contemporary, I think they are referred to by, by the applicant as the, the main house types and boundaries are related to that. So you have individual boundary treatments depending on the house type. Now, the overall approach that's being taken to those boundaries is considered to be acceptable by, by the council's landscape consultee, but further th thought is required in terms of the actual species selected in that in those occasions, um, just to make sure that it's actually appropriate for the site context itself and is suitable in terms of long term establishment. So what we're looking at there is conditions for this current application to require that detailed plot species to be to be submitted as a as a discharge of conditions and that to be agreed at that stage. Um, one thing, again, members will have been aware from the additional items paper that's been published that we have now had final comments from the County Council. We have confirmed that they've got no objections subject to the inclusion of conditions. Um, it's intended to include those conditions as, as part of the, the permission for the site, with the exception of one of the conditions which related to surface water drainage. 
Now, the reason for not including that on the current application is that it's already covered off by a condition on the appeal decision, which would still take effect. So is, there's no need to, to duplicate that condition in this case. So in this instance, the recommendation is to authorise the assistant director to, to uh, grant permission subject to the schedule of conditions included in the additional items paper. And I'll hand back to you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you very much, Adam, for a very thorough uh, presentation. Could I call on the applicants or the applicants agent, Chris Dwan, is it? Sorry if I do pronounce your name wrongly. Come and uh, speak when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Dwan. I am the planning director for Alison Homes. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I haven't got a great deal really to add to um, Adam's presentation, which was um, obviously very thorough. And I thank him for that, for giving a good representation of what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve. Um, essentially, sort of the closer we're getting to the, to the build stage, we've just had the sort of gaining knowledge about the site as we go. And um, the plans you have before you today for consideration are our best endeavours to sort of polish the approval that we um, received um, from your committee previously. Um, I think, um, I hope you all agree that we've, uh, we're adding value to the proposals and uh, we thank the officers for working collaboratively with us to, to achieve that. We had the cues from the previous open review and it, it was just a case of working out what we could do from a commercial perspective um, to sort of improve things. Um, from that regard, I think I'm personally, I'm sort of most excited by the, uh, the Terrace Crescent because I think that'll look fantastic. And uh, in, in particular, the, the way it's going to frame the key views to the um, churches, I think will be a real um, positive for the scheme. Um, further, other than that as well, highlight for me is probably the uh, the extension of the, the tree-lined um, spine road through, which will improve legibility and just give the sort of general greenness to the uh, sort of core of the development. Um, so yeah, as a um, developer, we're very, very excited by the prospect of um, developing out Manthorpe. It's, uh, you're probably aware, but we've, um, we've recently under uh, bought out and rebranded as Alison Homes from Larkfleet. And so we see the, um, still see South Stephen as a key core part of our uh, de development patch. And this will act as a bit of an exemplar scheme for, for us going forward, really. So we just want to do it as well as we possibly can. And uh, we'd welcome your support in sort of helping us get on that next step, really. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Do I have any questions? Councillor Jackie Smith. Yes. Um, do your new plans uh, include any facility for um, cars going into the, uh, the, uh, the small church that uh, is on the comes out at the moment with only about two parking spaces um, and not much else? And the other thing is that um, uh, that part is very close to the old village. And will you make a suitable link to draw people in as they come through to recognise that there, there is um, uh, a nice um, old type uh, house or housing is uh, there that uh, where the houses are up to 300 years old. So it's, it's a nice part uh, to, if you can uh, sort of guide people to that at the same time, it would be very nice. Thank you. Jackie, if you could just turn the mic off. Thank you. Yeah, in, in terms of vehicular access to the church, I, I think I've got uh, a mindful of where, where you're talking about. We, we're not uh, sort of providing any further vehicular link, links to the, the church per se. What we're trying to achieve, and it would probably be more apparent through the um, structural landscaping application that you, you should hopefully have before you in, in the non too distant future is we're, we're trying to sort of make the, the sort of uh, pedestrian routes link positively back to sort of key assets um, like you mentioned. Um, but I think that will probably come across, I think it's fair to say, Adam, <coughs> as, as part of that application. 
And within that, um, because we're mindful that the routes in question will be um, sort of quite a distance. Um, so with that in mind, we're looking at providing um, benches uh, along the pedestrian um, routes. So you could conceivably walk to church from the development, but have the ability to, to put your feet up on routes and enjoy the, uh, what, what we consider will be a very pleasant scenery around the development. Does, does that make sense to your question? Yes, thank you very much. But uh, the locals are quite concerned because uh, the road that runs um, from Belton through into Grantham is a major uh, and very busy route, uh, route. And we are concerned um, with uh, that part, part particularly um, because uh, the, uh, the old part of the village goes right onto the, uh, the main road. Um, so in some places without any footpath at all. Um, and that's where <coughs> the danger comes, so far as we can see, and if there's anything that can, even a small thing could make a difference. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, Councillor Ian Selby. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. All questions obviously by yourself. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Adam for the presentation. Um, two, two points, two questions. Am I correct in thinking that the uh, concerns of the Association of the Garden Trust will be coming forward uh, with regarding tree planting, um, as it mentions here, along the north and the east boundaries. Uh, that's in relation to the concerns with regarding Belton House and Belmont Tower. Uh, am I correcting that will come forward at a future um, application, I think, from my understanding from that? Um, and also, um, can you tell us what plans there are for something I always raise, uh, with regarding kiddies' play areas, please, because as it's been highlighted that with regard in the bridge, I know the kiddies, they'll, they'll play on the bridge. We know very well they will. So, you know, is there, is there could you just tell us what, what you've got forward for kiddies, whether that's coming forward at the next next part of the uh, application development that comes with us? Appreciate that. Thank you kindly. Uh, yes. Um, so... In terms of play spaces, there's going to be sort of three core, um, core areas where there'll be leaps provided through the scheme. So, and, and that, that'll all be interlinked with the structural landscaping and, and the open areas within that. So uh, sort of through various um, parts of, this, of the site. In terms of the tr um, sort of views um, from Belton, Belton House, it, it, again, that, that'll all form part of the um, structural landscaping uh, application, but as part of that, there is um, tree belts planned to sort of try and um, protect views from there. And it's, um, one thing we were mindful of is um, some of that will need to fall outside of the original red line. But what we're going to do is um, put a legal agreement in place so it guarantees the delivery of that as well. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rice Oxley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the Running Furrows Bridge. Um, I'm interested in its single carriageway. Um, I'm wondering if it would have traffic lights or, or signage, how that would be managed, and also what you envisage the usage of that would be as compared to the other um, roads on the site. Thank you. Um, in terms of the bridge, we were, um, it's, it's one of those where we, we were providing a bridge for construction and, and um, cycle links. So we thought, why not um, provide, make that? If we're building it anyway, might why not provide an additional um, point of vehicular access just to improve the sort of over, overall movements around the scheme and the uh, um, sort of the uh, sort of sustainability of the, the overall approach. Um, ideally, we looked at doing a, um, a dual lane um, approach, but it, it's tricky. We've had to realign some of the pro plots within that part of the site. To, um, and to get a double lane with the, um, it, it, it would have made the bridge probably a bit too substantial within the context of, the, of that location and undermine the running forest to a degree. Um, so I think at this stage, it's, um, it's a, bit, a bit outside my, <coughs> my scope of expertise, um, bridge design, but I imagine it will be priority signage like you get elsewhere within, within, uh, within the county. It's sort of bridges of, of, of that type. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's designed, it will have um, sort of cycleways both ways, but um, the, I think Adam's covered it in terms of the actual design, but 
uh, we were we were concerned about having it, the arch being too grand because then, as, as the gentleman's uh, uh, pointed out, it, there's this potential for for kids to look to play in that 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 part of the site. So we didn't want to encourage potential. Um, well, I suppose if you go back to nursery books of, uh, of younger years, we, we we know it's not good to encourage people to live under bridges. So. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, we, we thought uh, sort of the best next thing is to provide the recess. So from a distance, it will look to all intensive purposes like it is a, a sort of a, a standard bridge arch, but ultimately it'll allow the, the ID beads uh, and the sort of the easement under there to, to function uh, properly and without sort of compromise really. So that's the, it's, it's been very well thought out, I think, in, the um, highways department have, have um, provided particular scrutiny to the approach, so we are, to a degree, being led led by them on, on the sort of the ultimate arrangement of the bridge. Lovely, thank you, Councillor Morgan. Thank you. Um, my question is about the bridge as well and the change of the design. I'm just trying to understand. Um, with regards to the uh, function of the furrow, actually, um, is that a drainage? Is it for drainage or is, is it merely sort of like a his, historic in, indent? Um, and if it is for drainage, could that be affected by the altered design? Should there be um, heavy rainfall, for example? Um, yeah, the IDD, IDB drain uh, will be going under, underneath the bridge. Um, and we, what we've done is we've the design was based around what um, the requirements of the IDB in relation to the um, sort of construction of the, the easement under, underneath it. And essentially the, the size of pipe is, is, is what they're asking for. So there's no objection from the IDB in terms of the approach that we've, we've made. And what you probably noticed from the plans is there's um, sort of the landscaping in and around the bridge uh, is, going to be uh, separated by, is it nine metres? Uh, nine metres either side, and that's so they've got um, suitable access to, to, to maintain. But yeah, the, the, the approach is agreed and, and is in accordance with drainage requirements in that part of the site. Lovely, thank you. Do I have any more questions, Councillor Penny Milnes? Very quickly. Um, could you confirm that that bridge will be built in stone? Um, I, I don't know whether it'll be absolutely stone. I can't, I can't remember off, off the plans. I think the, the original one was brick build, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, it, it will be a, a, a suitable, um, suitable finish, whether that's reconstituted stone or sort of an appropriate um, combination of the two, because you've got the recess to, to factor in as well. So sort of the core elements will be designed appropriately and that will be as part of the, the, the condition will sort of provide your council with uh, the ability to scrutinise uh, the approach from that regard. But um, I wouldn't want to say definitive until detailed design is done because I don't know whether sort of that will undermine the sort of structural approach or, or, or that side of things, but that is the intention anyway. Happy with that? Well, because it's, I believe it's coming back at a later stage, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I am for now. Maybe I can ask Adam about it in uh, when we get that far. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Uh, thank you very much. You may take your seat. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Judy Stevens, if you have any um, registered interests that you'd like to disclose later on, because you missed that bit, please let us know. Thank you. Right, um, we will now go questions to officers, please. Do I have any? Oh, Councillor Morgan just picked you to the post there, Councillor Mills. Yeah, thank you. C could you just go back, because I think th this is quite fragmented, the approach we're having to take with this site. It's a bit unusual. We're not looking at it all together. Could you just go, and I think Councillor Selby kind of, hinted to that as well. Um, can you just go through the timeline of what will be discussed when and um, what's coming to committee or isn't? Thank you. 
Yeah, no, I appreciate what you're saying, Councillor. It it's certainly an unusual situation where we have two reserve matters applications which deal with separate elements of the landscaping. As I say, the, the application today is, is effectively looking at the residential plots themselves. So it deals with the actual boundaries of those plots and deals with sort of the, the, the green spaces between those plots. Things in terms of the actual detailed design of the, the play spaces, so provision for, for children's play spaces, et cetera, the detailed design of those elements of it, um, the areas of strategic open space. If I go back to this plan, just as an example, um, so sort of these strategic areas along this eastern boundary here and along this southern boundary here, the detailed design of those open spaces and the landscaping of those spaces, they're part of the set, the other reserve matters application, which we're hoping should be ready for committee probably sometime around either for the next committee or the one after that. Um, that's been in and running again, similar sort of process to the current application. It's been through design, design pad, et cetera. It's been with the, with the various consultees um, and it's just undergoing some, some final alterations to that. Um, so yeah, those more, more strategic spaces in terms of the actual design of the open spaces, that's covered off by the separate, the other reserve matters application. Um, but just in terms of those, say provision for children's play space, an example, the actual amounts that have to be provided on site, that's already covered off by the section 106 obligation for the scheme that was done at outline. So there's certain parameters for that that are already in place. Okay, lovely. Councillor Penny Milnes, please. Yes, just this minor point about um, the bridge being in stone. I think it's um, probably very important that it is in stone. I think we've got those historic assets um, to the east and Belton House. I think it would tie in then a, a lot better with those assets than it would in brick, which I think would look rather utilitarian, should I say. So is there any way we can make that a, a point? Can we put it as a request from the committee if, there, if anybody else agrees with me or um, at this stage? I think in fairness, the existing, the, the condition as it's worded at the moment says that the external appearance should be in broad accordance. So I think there's the scope within that for us to take that interpretation in terms of when the that future discharge of conditions applications come in that our expectation for that would be that it would be in stone. Um, I think as, as the applicant said, certainly that would be the ideal situation, particularly I know the way that the urban design officers commented in on the scheme so far has very much been looking at utilizing stone, particularly along that Eastern element of the site. So I think as a, as a planning authority, that's certainly what we would be encouraging. But as, as, as we've said, and as the applicant said as well, we don't necessarily want to predetermine what that technical consent in process is going to, is going to come up with, but certainly we'll, we'll be looking for, for that to be stone as, as best as possible. Yes, thank you, Adam. Um, I'm a little bit confused when you say the technical process. Does that determine the materials between brick and stone? Or it, I don't understand why that is being said. I just mean in terms of the actual design itself. Now, that, like you say, it doesn't necessarily determine the materials, but it, in terms of the actual design itself. So at the moment, we've got that recessed appearance, et cetera. It may well be that we have a slightly altered de actual design, et cetera. So pinning down exactly what elements would then be stone may be quite difficult if we don't know exactly what that final appearance is going to be until, until it's gone through that structural designing. Sorry, can we make a note at this stage that um, in view of the historic assets around and linkage with um, Belton House and Manthorpe and the church, that um, stone, it'd be a lovely feature, wouldn't it then? But I can't imagine it in brick. I think it would make a lovely feature otherwise. Minor point, but I think very important. I think in fairness, Council, then it's something that we can use as, as an informative to the applicant, almost the notes to the applicant that we use just to say that, yes, in terms of that, that 
this charger conditions, that final detail design strongly encouraged for that to be of stone appearance. And then again, that will then be assessed in terms of the actual appearance itself when it comes in through that condition. Lovely, thank you very much, Adam. Do I have any more questions, please? Councillor Stevens. I'm not sure it's a question, um, but I just wanted to sort of just say that that sounds a bit woolly, um, you know, that kind of technical thing, and it might, and we want to inform and but with expectation encouraging. I think we want that bridge to be stone. I think that's what the committee probably was saying. So could we condition that then? So um, there would obviously need to be a rest, uh, sorry, there'd need to be a um, motion to amend the condition if you wanted to insist on it being stone. I think what Adam has been saying is final design is yet to be decided, um, notwithstanding obviously the details that's shown in the plan. So they will still need to come to this council for approval for details subsequently. Um, if the members are minded to require it to be stone, then yes, and that is voted for, you could change the condition accordingly. Um, that would give the applicant obviously no leeway if there is a technical reason why they cannot um, use stone. The purpose of the informative is to remind the applicant that we expect to see stone um, and they would need to give us good reason, but you still got the flexibility. <coughs> Should there be a technical reason why stone was not appropriate or there was a better solution in place but really members it's it's up to yourselves but there would need to be a formal um, motion to make an amendment to that condition thank you can you put your microphone on please Councillor? i'd like to make that a proposition please thank you very much if you you noted what the proposition is please thank yeah. you um did you want to say anything else Councillor Smith? yes um i think uh, it will make a big difference because it doesn't matter which way you, you uh, look at that. Uh, the uh, main uh, part of it, the old village, would be between the two archways. And I think to put stone with that would really blend in very nicely indeed. To have stone, um, yes, but not to have uh, uh, the... Uh, the others, they, they, you know, the old stone just uh, is what it should be, not the new stone. Thank you, Councillor Penny Mills. Um, yes, I think um, if that's our wish, then I think the technical details should bear that in mind and be designed accordingly. I mean, what I don't want to see is a bridge being designed technically that then can't be built in stone. That does not make sense at all, does it? So it seems the right way round that if the stone is the desired material, then the bridge can be designed accordingly. So are you seconding Councillor Smith? Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bishnessing. So Madam Chairman, this has already been seconded. I was going to second Jackie's proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any other questions for the officer? Councillor Morgan. Um, if we've got a, a lovely stone bridge provided, um, but the rest of the site isn't has no stone, then it's kind. It's just going to be standalone feature, really. Um, I notice the use of material, the varied use of materials. Can you confirm will there be stone around the site? Is that the case? Yeah, so there's a number of house types that use use stone. I think it's probably particularly worth noting that this eastern phase along here, following a request from the urban design officer, a number of those front boundary treatments have been changed to stone wall as well. So I think in terms of your concern, Councillor, I think having that stone feature bridge with those stone front boundary treatments, it will tie in with, with sort of the, those public boundaries that you see within the surrounding of that bridge design, yes. Thank you, Councillor Oxley. I might have misunderstood, but can you just, could one of the officers just explain to me the, the, just of the motion, the consequences of that? Because um, it sounded quite serious. I think you were saying that if, if we made it a condition that they build it in stone, and then for a technical reason, they're not actually able to build it in stone, some sort of geographic reason, that then what? No one can build the bridge or... I, 
I'm just trying to understand, you know, what the what because what, I understand what you're saying that, that you want to leave some flexibility for technical reasons. So I'd just like to understand the consequences of that motion going through. Thank you. I think Emma may correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially what it would need then would be for a variation to the condition first for them then to 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 almost reintroduce that flexibility to the materials if that was was the situation that was needed. If as the motion is at the moment to discharge that condition would require that detailed design to be in stone. So if it was then found that it, for, for some technical reason it couldn't be, the applicant would have to vary the condition first before they could then get approval of that final design. So that would come back again. So is that is that possible? Is that a possible, just sounded very difficult when, when, when you first said it. <laughs> Um, no, it, it's not difficult. It just means what we call a Section 73 application, which is another application for, um, for actually it wouldn't be a Section 73 because it's reserved matter, it'd be a new reserved matters application, sorry, just to look at those details. It's not impossible, it, it's just extra um, work that the applicant would need to go through in order to, to deal with it, that's all. So it's, yeah, no, not, not a big issue. Thank you. Do I have any other questions from anybody? Anybody wishing to start a debate? No. Anybody wishing to propose? Councillor Bis. Madam, I, I propose that we go along with the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Um, I think we would need to vote on the proposal that Councillor Smith has made and that was seconded. So. Um, so if we could go for a vote on that additional condition that the bridge be built in stone, all those in favour, please raise your hand. That's unanimous. Thank you on that condition. So, um, so if you're happy to propose it with that additional condition, are you? Yes, Madam Chairman, I'm happy to propose including the additional proposal uh, for the, uh, to be approved. Lovely, do I have a seconder for that, please? Councillor Jackie Smith. Could you put your mic on, please, so we can hear you? Right, lovely, thank you. So, all those in favour, please raise your hand. And again, that is unanimous. Thank you very much, that's been approved. Right, okay. Will you be long, councillor? Otherwise, we'll have to hold the meeting up. Well, then you won't be able to vote. Right, lovely. Now we will go to uh, agenda item four and we have Ellie Siler. Doing the presentation, I believe. Thank you. When you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon, councillors. Um, this next application is reference S211210. It's a reserve matters application for a residential development on Swinstead Road in Corby Glen. My name is Ellie Silla, and I'm one of the senior planning officers at the council. So the key issues on this one are the impact on the character of the area, residential amenity, highway safety and drainage. 
This is an aerial view of the site uh, within a wider context. So this site is annotated there with the red arrow. To the north, you've got the village of Corby Glen. To the west, there's agricultural land as well as to the south. Um, just to the south of the site is a memorial hall and playing field. And then on the opposite side of Swinstead Road, uh, you've got the Charles Reed Academy School and an allocated residential site just to the south of that, which is for approximately 250 dwellings. So this is a closer up view of the site. Uh, just to the north, you've got Ferndale Close. You can see those residential dwellings back onto the site. Uh, the access would be from Swinstead Road, which has already been um, approved under the outline application. Just to the, uh, it's also to the west of Swinstead Road, you've got the paddocks as well, uh, adjacent to the site. And then to the south, you've got a private track, uh, just separating the playing field from the site. So to the right hand side there, you've got the red outline of the site that was submitted. And then the photograph to the left was taken from within the garden of the paddocks, looking to, what, to the west across the site. And then the photo to the left, that's on Swingstead Road looking south. Um, you can just see on the right hand side, the access to the paddocks. So the access for the proposed site would just be to the north of that. Um, and then the photograph on the right hand side, that's looking towards the rear of the properties on Ferndale Close, that's looking towards the north. And then this photo on the left was taken from the private track to the south. Um, the building that you can see is an outbuilding within the site of the paddocks. And then the, the photo on the right hand side, that's again looking across the site from that private track towards Ferndale Close. So this is the proposed site layout. Um, it's, it's the 25 dwellings that are being proposed. There is a variety of size and dwelling types, uh, ranging from one bedroom bungalows up to the largest, which is a four bedroom detached house. The scheme is being proposed as 100% affordable. So this would be a mixture of affordable rent as well as shared ownership. There's a large open space proposed to the southwest of the site that you can just see there. Um, that incorporates Suds features such as an attenu attenuation pond. Um, also street trees are incorporated on that open space as well as on the actual road sides. And then there are two parking spaces per dwelling. This is an example of the street scene. So the top row is what you would see as you're entering the site. So that's plots one to five. And then the bottom row, you can see plot five on the right hand side. And that's going around to the northwest side of the site where the bungalows are. Uh, this just gives an idea of the boundary treatments. Um, there's a variety that are being proposed. So the, the rear gardens are mostly uh, bordered by closed bordered fencing, timber fencing, and then there's a variety of different boundaries that you can see from within the street scene. Um, in terms of the design and the layout, it has gone through uh, quite a few changes throughout the, the application process. This was based upon comments that were given by the urban design officer. It has been to a design pad meeting, and those changes have been incorporated. Um, such as facing some of the dwellings towards that open space and just creating a bit more character with the boundary treatments and the layout um, of how it's set out. So to give a quick summary then, the character is considered acceptable and it's not considered to have an adverse impact on the couch of the area. Um, in terms of amenity, the separation distances and the layout is um, acceptable in terms that it won't have any loss of light or loss of privacy or cause any noise impacts that would be un unacceptable. Highways have no objections to the proposal. Um, relating back to the outline proposal, there was a, 
a condition requiring a footpath to create access between the site and the memorial hall. Um, but following further discussions with highways, it's, it's deemed more appropriate to have two crossings instead and, and use the pathway on the opposite side of the road. So that's, that's been um, secured by condition. And then in terms of drainage as well, the Lead Local Flood Authority are happy for this to be conditioned. The drainage scheme that's been submitted does include subs features, but um, County have basically said that they'd like to see more and they are in discussions for that as well. So that they're happy that that can be conditioned. So um, just to conclude then, the proposal is considered to be in accordance with the local plan and the NPPF and the recommendation is to approve subject to the conditions that are set out within the report and the additional items report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Happy to take questions. Thank you. We'll do your questions a bit later. But thank you. Turn the mic off. And we will have our first speaker. That's uh, Mr. Colin Smith, who's against. Thank you. If you'd like to come up and speak. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My, my name's Colin Smith. I am the owner of the paddock Swinshead Road. The bungalow, I had, I had the planning permission for six years there, and it's nearly cost me a million pounds to build it. Right, now the situation is, this planning application is not, I'm not happy with it at all because you're putting a road right down the side of my bedrooms. You're putting development uh, housing right at the back of my property. Six metres, I think, the near, nearest house. You've got six acres of land there to, to design. You could do it a lot better than that. I'm not very happy at all. So if you put my, I've got one window in my end bedroom, one metre by one and a half metres. You're putting a house, two houses, right at the back of my bedroom. I was going to, Ellie said to me, we'll put trees up. You can't put trees or edging. It's going to take the light. Your house is going to take the light out of my bedroom. I've only got that one window in that, a six metre bedroom, square bedroom. It's ridiculous. I'm not happy at all. Could that development be altered? You know, how would you like a road right down the side of your bedroom? How would you like a road? Um, um, you're not asking me questions. You're here to give a statement. That's your right, views. but Thank not, you. not many people would like a road at the side of the bedrooms. Surely that could be done. Why can't the road go down the side where it already is, down Ferndale House driveway? They've put their property on the market. They've sold it. First of all, they, they conned everybody. They put it on the market with the right move at 950000 without telling anybody about the development. We got in touch with right move. I did. And they got back to them, they knew nothing about it. Now, right move of not nearly £200,000 off that property, and they have sold it. Now, they wasn't going to tell people about the development. 30 seconds. Things, everything's got out of order down there. And not only that, the road, road uh, in front of my place is absolutely terrible. Because the now... You're doing the other development up the road there. I put a wall, cost me £20,000 along the front, and it's cracking now, I see, because the lorries are getting so close to the road. It's terrible. But what the planning permission was only granted if there was a footpath put down the front. Thank you. Your time is up. If you'd like to turn your microphone off, 
I believe I have a question from Councillor Robinson either. I've got lots actually, Madam Chairman. I don't know if you want to put it piecemeal or um, some will be. Sorry, sorry I'll, the beginning. I've, I've got a good few actually. Um, so I don't know if you want to take it. Not for no. Sorry, I got confused there. I thought it was a question. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Morgan, did you have one question? Excuse me. Sorry. Would you, I've got a question for you. Thank you. Um, yes, um, through, if I may, through the, through the chair, um, you mentioned concerns regarding the end window um, and your bedroom, bedroom windows. Um, on, on the diagram, there is a, I have to say, it is a small gap if we look between your property and the neighbouring proposed new properties. Can you just explain, is, you, I'm just clarifying that yours is single storey, is that correct? You said it was a bungalow, is that right? First of all. Uh, yes, but I have got planning permission to put five bedrooms up in the roof. But at the moment it's single. Uh, development has started going up in the roof and all my bedroom windows will be looking right in the back of their, their properties anyway, if that development goes ahead. So can you clarify at the moment your perception is from the existing plans and the, the proposal before us that you would be overlooked in your bedroom area from the new properties? Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you very much. You may take a seat now. Thank you. Thank you. And then could we call uh, Mr John Roberts, the agent, please? And if you'd like to start when you're ready, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of the application. My name is John Roberts, and I'm from RGP, the architect for the application. I believe your officer's report provides a very fair and balanced assessment of the merits of the site, but I'd like to emphasize the following points. The site already has planning permission through outline consent granted in March 2019. We have worked constructively and objectively with your officers, including attending the design review, design pad review, to be the position where the scheme is presented with a recommendation for approval today. There are no technical objections to the development, and all other comments raised during the application process have been dealt with. Following approval, these houses will be constructed and occupied in the next two years. This site will not become a land bank. Dwelling types of housing proposed are a mixture. There are one and two bed bungalows, together with two, three, and a four bed home. These will provide a balanced community for both growing families and downsizers. All statutory consultees are either content with the details submitted or through additional technical detail to be submitted later via condition. All separation and amenity distances have been met. We've introduced a variety of dwelling types and materials across the site. This introduces many character areas, but it picks up the varied materials and details found in the village centre itself. There have been extensive discussions from both highways and drainage, which are reportedly uh, accurate, sorry, sorry, which are reported accurately in the officer's report, and both consultees are happy with the proposals. There is further design work required on the drainage, but the principles of the stormwater system draining into the ground as opposed to sewers is agreed. The connection to the playing fields and the south is proposed which crosses the gravel track, which is just a farmer's field access to the rear fields. The road is to be adopted by the county and the open space and private drives will be managed by the Housing Association with a dedicated maintenance subcontracting teams with regular regimes. This will need to be agreed under the proposed landscape management condition. In summary, your officer concludes there are no issues with the proposal and the scheme will provide a positive contribution to the local housing supply. I therefore trust your committee will support your officer, officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any questions? Councillor Robbins, thank you. I think I've got two for the developer and the rest for uh, the officer, if that's all right. 
Um, one of them is very premature, so we'll leave that till last, if I may. Um, there is a need for affordable homes in Corby Glen, uh, and, and I welcome um, that there are single storey dwellings in that development. Uh, again, um, is a need for um, for that type of, of, uh, of house in, in Corby Glen. Um, I agree with Mr. Smith um, that perhaps the um, it, it seems strange to me, and, and there must be a, an answer. But I'm, I'm hoping we can get around it some way. Um, it seems very strange that you've got a large um, parcel of open space, uh, which is nice with the trees, and, and I welcome that as well. Um, it, it's quite a well-designed layout. However, is there a way that you can flip the houses that are near to Mr. Smith's house over to where the open space is and have the open space where, uh, where the paddock um, boundary is, um, the, the, the title boundary? Uh, that's my first one to you. Uh, Shall we just answer that one first? Okay. Thank you. Yes, that's fine. Um, I suppose looking at the original outline indicative layout, um, which was indicative and it had a, a 25 units, the same as this, but they were larger properties on that majority. I think looking at the mix, there were seven, five beds and five, four beds, larger executive houses with detached double garages and the like, and that kind of thing, very spaced out accordingly. Again, as you say, we are providing affordable homes here. It's approximately a 50 50 split. 12 and 13 uh, rented and shared ownership. Um, there's because of the sizes of units that we're doing here, you know, we don't necessarily need to have large gardens and that sort of thing. So with the gardens and spaces associated with the units are an appropriate size for the dwelling size. So we've got more land than we need to develop on and that sort of thing, obviously. But also we've got suds in here. We need to incorporate all that. So we've got swales on the roads, we've got the suds pond itself. Uh, gravity kind of tends to drain itself to the bottom sort of southern boundary anyway that's where the pump station is so it's kind of draining that way anyway so I think in terms of levels and again in terms of urban design obviously we're on edge of um, village sort of center here so what we've tried to do is put housing back to back onto the existing properties I can understand where you're coming from in terms of let's have open space here flip the housing but then what we kind of tend to do in open um, design principles is you want to back onto existing properties. So the last thing you want to do is to leave open rear fences against public areas that you can have nuisances, people kicking in fences, jumping over fences and burglaries and things like that. So we've kind of designed it purposely to back onto the existing houses to provide those boundaries being secure. And then the public open space on the village side so that we sort of then got that, that buffer zone really. Thank you, Councillor Robbins. Sorry, can I come back? Yeah, um, don't buy that, unfortunately. Um, yes, I agree, there might be antisocial behaviour. But if you look at the south western corner, that's miles from anywhere house, isn't it? That's great for antisocial behaviour. Put the open space in the middle between the houses and that kind of dissipates it a bit. So I, I don't buy where the open space is to stop antisocial behaviour. Actually, the way your development is, is actually going to not encourage it, but it, it can go on in that corner without even being seen. Um, that'd be my pushback. Can I just respond to that? I mean, obviously all the dwellings that we've got um, uh, on this, that side and that side of the public open space overlook it. They've got front doors, they're overlooking that space. The danger is if we, um, the paddocks obviously has no, there's a single story building and there's a rear fence there. There's no, no surveillance on the paddocks onto our site. And therefore, if we moved the housing over and had a big open space there, while we could have houses that face back towards the paddocks and overlook at it, the boundary for the paddocks will just be a timber fence. So therefore, there's no security for the back of the paddocks. Thank you. Do I have any other questions for the agent? Yeah. Small premature one. Um, very premature. And I, I don't know if, it, if, it's, if it's you or, or the, the, the sister that needs to sort it, but... Would there be a would there be a preference to uh, the parish council naming? How, how many streets are there? Is it just one road, or is it going to be two or three, or do you know? Probably just one, maybe two. In that case, whether it's one or two, would would you have any uh, problem with the parish council naming the roads? Probably not. I mean, must admit, um, the housing association who are not uh, NCHA, um, mostly housing associations do tend to look for local communities and, and engage with the parish councils and are very forthcoming in 
naming it locally after you know the last one I did we named after a retired serviceman or something like you know they're quite actively in sort of doing that thing so you know I'm sure they'd be very well open to that situation I can certainly pass on your comments to the housing association yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that'd be really really useful thank you thank you uh, councillor Morgan thank you um can you just clarify uh the road um, again, through the chair, if it's uh, if you're happy for me to ask a question, but looking at the plan on the um, western, most western side, northerly, um, we've got um, what appears to be, uh, in effect, a dead end with regards to the road. So um, we seem to have, I know there are some sites where this occurs, um, but we seem to have properties that ex are built beyond the actual road layout. Can I just get clarity around that? And also, what feedback have you had from the emergency services regarding accessing those properties or turning around on, on in that area? Um, so to clarify, all, all the grey roads, so as you come in, go left around the bend, around to the turning head, um, will be adopted. At the minute, that's tarmac, but there are discussions with the highway authority whether or not that will become block paving and permeable. The, as you go, as you turn around left into the bend and turn the turning right, that little sort of T-shaped hammerhead that's block paving, that is going to be adopted as well. So those are the adopted parts. The other lighter brown ones in covering so the top two properties, or actually three potentially, and the top left hand corner, the four properties facing south of the public open space and the properties backing onto the paddocks are the only bits of small private drives that will be owned and maintained by the housing association. Um, and in terms of uh, access for services, that's absolutely fine. Um, the regulations for uh, fire truck access is in 45 meters of the homes. So you know, there's no issues in terms of bin collection lorries um, or fire truck accesses. All the roads have been uh, tracked for the appropriate vehicles concerned and the highways have approved the design of the road as it stands. Thank you. Um, Councillor Judy Stevens. Well, actually, my question's been answered. Thanks very much about the adoption of the roads. Well done. That's good. That's good. Any other questions for the agent? Oh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, I've got to agree with Councillor Robbins to some degree. Um, I can't see a problem with flipping it, but there again, you've explained why. But could we not leave more of a space between the boundary of the paddock and the houses and just move them over slightly? To give him a little bit more privacy, would that be possible? I mean, even if you only gave him another meter, it would be a bonus. Um, the dwellings, as it stands, obviously looking at oh, very small scale plan here. My eyesight is fading a little bit. Um, obviously, look, you've got the dwelling. You've then got the parking space and the footpath by the side of it, and then it looks like the same distance again in terms of width. So, so the dwellings are, are five meters away from the boundary, um, and all the the dwelling frontages the gables that front onto the paddocks are all blank gables there are no windows in that you know we have bought them oh, they're not on the boundary they're sort of five meters or so away from the boundary and and as, as the plan is showing there is sort of landscaping down the side as well to aid to aid that that buffer for where the actual dwellings are so um, i think we have brought them away and obviously by the sound of it your plan is to is to approve for uh, the scheme as presented today i think we sort of brought it away in terms of the uh, your officer is, is, is acceptable in terms of the separation distances that we've got. Um, it's been through the designer as well, and, and they're happy with the scheme. So I think I think we've we've addressed the comments internally that have come out through the, the consultation process. Lovely, thank you. Do I have anybody else? No, thank you very much. No, sorry, you have to, no. Your husband, I believe, is it your husband? He's already no, partner. your partner's already spoken, and you have to give notice. So I can't. Um, no. Thank you. I'd like to. Do I have uh, any members wish to ask uh, officers questions, please? Councillor Robbins. Thank you. Good for you. Do you want to take them all on block or as answer as they go? Can, can we go through the list of objections? please, uh, on, uh, for, for members going to page 49 on the agenda page. Uh, page 49. 
just just to, uh, just to go through the, the the objections that have come that have gone through as, as a um, result of the consultation um, some of them we can increase in traffic which it will do um, obviously it has a high volume of traffic and HV and that's fine um, the overlooking we've spoken about about flipping the, the design and I'm, I'm still quite keen on, on that to happen um, the development bears no resemblance to the outline permission that, that that's fine because it's now on reserve and this is being discussed um, um, the layout be arranged to retain views of the countryside again by flipping that development that would be I guess mitigated um, um, footprint of the bungalows noise pollution again we, we can't do anything about that it contradicts the local plan the site was allocated yes it was but it was taken off the local plan and put back in so th th that that's fine um, and be visually, visually intrusive so some of these haven't been addressed can, can you would you go through and, and, and sort of mitigate some of the So the one you were saying about the views to the countryside, that wasn't actually that wasn't an objection from the paddocks. That was from dwellings on Ferndale Close. Um, so the layout as it is would actually be better. In, I mean, views aren't really a material consideration anyway, private views. But the way it's laid out now, the bungalows are what would be adjacent to the to the Ferndale Close properties. So keeping those lower at the lower height is obviously going to be better for them in terms of views. And um, if you were to flip it, you'd have far more houses on that side that's, that would intrude into the countryside. Um, so in terms of layout, I think that is better for the views. Um, which were the other ones that you don't think have been addressed? What's the, what's the hectare site? Uh, how many hectares is a site? It's one and a half. Right, I, I'm, I'm just sort of going through as well. So it's so a four and against, so, so it's well within, um, you know, 30 per hectare, isn't it? So it's well within the, the, sort of the, the density and actually it's, it's quite an open, um, open development, isn't it? So, okay, so um, move on. Um, uh, is, is there a provision for fire hydrants? Um, yes, so the fire and rescue service were consulted. They haven't commented on the application, um, but in terms of the roadways, it's it's acceptable. Highways have um, not had any objection and they would take into account access for fire services. Yeah, access is one thing. Are there any fire hydrants? Um, no, I don't believe so. I think there needs to be. Um, can, yeah, can, can we make a note of, of that, that comment then, please? Um, I know the construction management plan isn't written yet, but can we specify times and days of construction as well? I, I guess for that, is that a standard thing? Um, yes, we can um, condition that it's only in certain hours and certain days. Sorry, can you put your mic? Yeah, 5.1.1, page 46. Um, it would all the roads be adopted uh, before construction? I, thought, I think um, that the, the developer answered that in part, but it was just the, 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 sort of the, the light, light brown bits, of the buff bits that were still... Um, can you confirm they are going to be adopted as well to RCC standard before construction is completed? So only the dark grey areas of road are going to be adopted by highways and there is just that, those small amounts that are private driveways. Okay. Is there a reason for that? Obviously, the, 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 the householders pay for the, the upkeep of, of, the, of the rest of it then, don't they? Um, I believe because it's a 100% affordable housing scheme, there's a, there, there's a management company anyway, so there is a service charge with, with dwellings like this, which would cover the maintenance of the private drives. Um, 
Okay. Um, can you tell me what crossings they are at both the end of the pathway and the end of the of, of the road? Yes, I believe there's a, they're going to be zebra crossings, um, but in any case, this will be dealt with um, with highways under section 184, I think it is, agreement, um, because it's outside of the red line. But that has all been agreed with, with highways. They're, ha they're happy, they're the ones that have suggested it. So it is obviously likely to be carried out. Uh, thank you, Emma. I believe you wanted to come in there. Yeah, so I just wanted to come in with a couple of points just to try and help members. Obviously, this is reserve matters. So um, the county, um, as you've obviously been advised, will pick up things like any crossings and details. But a lot, a lot of this will largely have been dealt with at the outline stage. Um, and just a point on the adoption of the roads, we can't actually require that they are adopted. Um, all we can do is at best um, require that they're built to an adoptable standard. Um, but not that they're actually adopted. That's a matter for county to, to, to resolve and to deal with through their section um, 38 process, which is the agreement they'd have, the developer would have to enter into under the Highways Act to um, get the roads adopted and to pay the appropriate um, bonds and various bits and pieces. So um, we're, we're in danger slightly of straying outside of our um, role and um, powers if, if we start trying to meddle too much in that area, I'm afraid. Thank you. If I, because um, you've asked several questions, Councillor Robbins, I'll come back. I'll just give the people a chance to, to ask questions. I think it was uh, Councillor Businessing next, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I would like to ask the uh, officer if, if the, um, on paragraph 5.2.3, the last uh, uh, dots, in fact, provide details how the scheme shall be maintained and managed over the lifetime of the development. Have we got anything to firm or uh, commitments that who is going to be, or which public body is going to, or statutory body is going to undertake the maintenance of the arrangement for the, uh, for the roads and the drainage systems? Um, so my understanding is the foul water drainage system will be adopted by angling water, um, so like the pumping station. Um, and then the suds, the suds that will come forward within the drainage strategy uh, would be maintained by whoever is managing the site, the management company. Will it be possible for you, Ellie, to, to point out which of the, because there's a white road that I go all the way under the one, one is below great and then a bit white as well. Which one is the Lincolnshire County Council is going to adopt? It's, uh, so this one here, this, and that one. So the gray ones, it's here, here, and here that are the private drives. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Penny Robbins, thank you. Thank you. I just want to um, point out, I've got a couple of questions. The ownership of the common grass area uh, should be clear who is responsible for this. Um, can it be registered as a public open space and can it include the possibility of it being registered as an asset of community value? Um, so can the um, section 106 contributions then be used in part to fund the maintenance of this? That's the first question. I'm just going to pass over to Chris Brown to answer this one. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so with regards to the maintenance of that public open space, there's planning condition uh, nine. It's before any part of the development hereby committed is occupied slash brought into use. A landscape management plan shall have been submitted to and approved in writing by us. And that covers the long term design objectives, management responsibilities and the maintenance schedules of that public open space. So you, all the, the further maintenance details of that will, will come forward. In terms of the, the future ownership, so effectively that's secured through the, the permitted plans, which is, is the, the site layout in front of you. Uh, shown as public open space so effectively any application would have to come forward it can't change away from public open space for assets of community value um, I'm happy 
for Emma to, to correct me, but my understanding of that is that we can't secure that through the planning process at this stage. It's only once the development, uh, if it's permitted, was then built out, once the open space is then publicly available, then the, uh, the relevant body, so be it the parish council or the neighbourhood planning group, could then make an application for it to be an asset of community value. We can't secure that at this current stage of the planning process. Thank you. Yeah, if it's a quick one. That's lovely, thank you. Can I just ask one more and then I'll leave? Um, also, um, can you, um, has the garden wall been pulled back on plot 12? On that basis, can we see the revised final site layout with the amendments included? And um, what's on the screen is the revised, um, revised layout, and that's in the addition. It is, so on plot 12, the front is, you can see the tree is in front of the front elevation. So that's the semi-detached, they're semi-detached. So the front of plot 12 faces east, roughly, and then the front of the adjoining property faces south. So the, the parking that you can see to the south, that is to the side elevation of that dwelling. I haven't got the... Um, house types within the presentation, sorry, otherwise I would show you. Well, the, yeah, there is a tree in, in on that grass area in front. Sorry, can I just ask for clarification in here? I think I can see plot 12. Yeah. Is that one on the corner of the dark grey? And then I see two little parking points sort yeah. of like on the bend, and then it looks like there's a pathway. Is that the correct one or is that the correct one? Yeah, so where this is the front yeah, of plot 12, one. parking for plot 12, and then this, is that 13? I'm not sure. Um, and then the parking for that one is to the side. Parking for this dwelling is here, and then that parking there is for this dwelling. Oh, sorry, Councillor Morgan, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have any diagrams or, that show the elevation of the paddocks with the neighbouring properties so that we can appreciate the um, relationship between them? Um, I've not got any elevations that include the paddocks, but... Uh, just for reference, the closest dwelling to the paddocks, it's actually 11 metres from, from the elevation, from the paddocks. So that distance here is 11 metres. And there's no windows on this side either. The only windows are looking this direction. Thank you. Um, Gloria, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. One question has already been answered, and I think I've answered my second question. Has even the one bedroom property has got two parking spaces? If so, I think that's great. Uh, yes, they, all of the properties have two, two spaces. Lovely. Uh, Councillor Phil Dilks. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, Follow-up, Councillor Nick Robbins, um, questions and indeed... Um, uh, Councillor Charmaine Morgan's questions. Um, I, I, I just wanted a bit more clarification, and if you could show, you possibly just answered it, saying it's eleven metres. But um, we seem to be hearing conflicting things about the uh, the separation distances, and I'd just like some sort of guidance on what would be considered, you know, whether this is considered normal or acceptable. And whilst I um, hear what you say and accept that loss of a private view is not a material consideration uh, when considering planning applications. Lo can you just confirm that loss of privacy overlooking and overshadow, overshadowing is a material consideration as is noise and disturbance from um, what's being proposed? Um, and, and even, you know, impact on visual amenity. Could you just confirm those things? Thank you. Yes, so visual amenity is obviously a material consideration. That's in terms of character. 
um, rather than residential amenity. Um, overlooking loss of privacy and loss of light are all material considerations. With the distance there of 11 metres, and you can see it's staggered as well, the rear elevation of the closest property to the paddocks is, is in line with that side elevation. So it's not actually, it, it wouldn't cause a lot of light to the paddocks. Um, there are no windows directly looking towards the paddocks in terms of what's acceptable. Um, there's design guidelines that have recently been adopted. And one of the, um, well, the guidelines in that is that there's a 21 meter gap where you have a back-to-back -back elevation. So that would be where you would have windows looking towards other habitable room windows. And there isn't that situation within that layout, which is why it's acceptable. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I always say, and um, um, one of the objections also talked about um, overlooking and privacy issues for Ferndale Close and Ferndale House. I'm, I'm just not sure where they are on the on the map, and, and just uh, perhaps it's a comment, but I suppose it's 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 you know in an urban area. I hear what you're saying and, you know, would, would kind of go along with it. But this isn't an urban area. This is, you know, some guys built this house in the, frankly, in the middle of the countryside, as, as seems to me. Um, and I've got some sympathy with what he's saying. Thank you. Yeah, so, as, yeah, it is, it's not within the village. The paddocks is not within the village, but this development is going to be part of Corby Glen, although it's on the edge, but it's it's making up part of the part of the village um, as it's adjacent to. Excuse me, can we not have people calling out in the background? That is not acceptable. Thank you. As I was saying, as it's adjacent to existing development, we've also got the um, allocated site on the other side for 250 dwellings. So it's clearly um, you know, part of the wider Corby Glen area. So I, in some ways I would disagree that, you know, it is actually um, an urban area, even if it is more of a rural village. Um, oh, what was the other part of the question? Sorry. <laughs> oh, Ferndale Close, yes. So what you can see then just here above um, to the north and the minimum distance between these properties and those is 22 metres, but the majority are a greater distance away. Thank you. Councillor Bishnessi. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just come from, I forgot the first time. Uh, will it be possible for you to, you know, the uh, paddocks, the back of the paddocks, the bunker, which is parallel to the road and the entrance road, What's the distance between that? Because I believe that's where the four windows are actually situated uh, to that to to the actual road fence and to that uh, bungalow or the is it a, a semi-detached house that is on the other side? I just wondered the elevations may cause privacy problem. Um, do you mean this this elevation to the right of yeah? So from this side elevation to the road, it's 8.5 metres and you would have the boundary fence and also planting that's proposed landscape, including the trees, uh, which would mitigate somewhat some of the, the, the noise. Um, and then I'm not sure of the distance between there and the dwellings on the opposite side of the road, but they're, they're detached two-storey dwellings opposite. Sorry, uh, I would say, if you say it's eight metres from that edge, middle to the edge of the road, I would say there'll be further to that, those two buildings that's more as facing the road. There, yeah? I would say probably 16 metres maximum, but over there you said there's 21 metres between the Ferndales. So I think that this quite a lot closer may affect the privacy of the of the individual space in the bedroom. 
Um, I'm not entirely sure where the position of the windows are, but I don't believe there's any direct views. And also with the um, boundary treatments in between, you're not going to have any, the windows on the, the paddocks are at single storey level. So there's not going to be any direct views between opposite windows. Thank you, uh, Councillor Penny Milnes. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate this is a reserve matters application. Um, do we debate at the same time or not on this? <laughs> yeah. um, to me, this is part of the problem of these outline applications, access only. There was an indicative plan at the time, I'm not going into the merits or not of that, a mix of housing between affordable and market housing, completely different arrangements. And um, they're not worth the paper they're written on, are they? Let's face it, we've, we've discovered this in the past. And here we are now with, with this, which is all affordable. Um, we're classing it, I assume, as SP4, which is an edge of village development. And you've mentioned character yourself. And when you look around at the properties in this area, they are larger properties with larger gardens that are now being impacted by a lot of smaller properties with much smaller gardens and um, has been alluded to a rather more urban application of spatial differences and you know it does concern you on uh, when you initially look at it you think oh that wonderful lovely open space you know it'll, it'll attract me when you look at the impact on the existing properties that's where it starts to fall apart i think yeah. and um i don't know i i think we, we're titillating at the edges but sp4b you know goes on about the character and setting of the area and i think we I've just said the larger properties with larger gardens, this is not like that. Um, and okay, Corby Glen's growing, but this particular part of Corby Glen is relatively spacious and rural. And I'm not sure that we've got this right. Um, I think, um, you know, the access road probably needs more buffering to the paddocks. I think the paddocks needs a bit more protection. It was there first and um, they've got nice spacious grounds. They've got windows downstairs. They're going to have windows upstairs. And then we've got all this open space, um, which looks lovely on the face of it. I'm just wondering, you know, we're going against our own policies here, aren't we, on, on um, being designed and appropriate in scale and layout and character to the setting of the area. Um, and I don't suppose it's infill, but who knows these days, and pretty similar um, uh, conditions there, you know, no unacceptable impact on the occupiers of each of adjacent properties. I'm just a bit concerned that this does impact. And, um, you know, I, I think to say that you've protected the views from Ferndale Crescent, as you say, is not a material consideration. But I think looking at the protecting the paddocks and, and looking at the open nature of the existing properties, this doesn't fit. The, the layout just doesn't fit. Um, and I'm not convinced you can Titivate with it, um, you know, just pushing a few houses around. I'm not sure. The other thing I'd just like to ask, sorry, I've just said that. Um, this pumping station in, in the bottom corner, what, what's all that about? Could you explain it a bit better? But um, my main gist is that I don't think this fits our own policies on SP4, despite the fact that it's got an outline approval. And um, can I just make the point that I think as a committee, I, I, I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I think we've said this before, we don't like outlines for this very reason. I've said enough, I think. Thank you, Councillor Wilms. Emma, would you like to come in? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not surprised you don't like outline applications. It's something I've heard before, not just from this planning committee, but from other councillors. Um, and I can understand why it, it is difficult for um, people to fully 
um, appraise something when there's so little information the first time round. But unfortunately, outline applications have been here for a long time and um, there's no sign that they're disappearing at all. Um, this means that we're, we're, we're stuck with outline applications. Um, I cannot stress enough, this site has got outline application, outline planning permission for residential dwellings on this particular site. The matters and the only matters that we can consider today are the details relating to the layout, the scale, the appearance, the access and the landscaping. I know that sounds like a lot, um, but some of the points that you seem to be concerned about members really relate back to the principle of development. And I'm afraid that's gone. You've already approved that as a council. It already has outline, uh, outline planning permission. The site access can only be in one location from that main road. Therefore, it is going to run adjacent to, in some location, the neighbouring property at the paddocks. Um, it is perfectly reasonable, in my opinion, in terms of the separation distance between the road and the paddocks, um, to have that, that sort of separation distance in terms of um, impact on the neighbours. Yes, there is going to be an impact. Every development will impact somebody somehow. We cannot um, keep everything the same, otherwise we wouldn't build anything anywhere. Um, so in terms of the access, it was always clearly going to be somewhere in that vicinity because that is the only access. In order to build a significant use of a number of dwellings and to make efficient use of the land, you have to look at it in terms of its, its sort of a reasonable layout. And actually what you've got in front of you is actually reasonably generous because it, it still has that open space area, um, which is gonna be for the benefit of the future occupiers. You could look at, could you flip it around? Um, but actually then the paddocks are gonna have um, open space adjacent to them. Um, that may be actually be less desirable from a um, noise intrusion, having kids play their ball games, et cetera, et cetera. So there could be other consequences. Um, in terms of the separation distance, I'm sorry we can't get the plans up for the paddocks, but I have looked at them on screen. They've got a side window in that end gable, which has, has already been pointed out, is about five metres from the nearest building that's at ground floor. So there will be provided um, some degree of screening from the fencing or the boundary treatments that are already there. It's a ground floor window. The um, dormer windows that are in the consented scheme um, to deal with the first floor accommodation that the speaker already told us about are further back in on the site um, in, in sort of the, the stem of the T section as it were. Um, so there's a greater separation distance. And in my opinion, that is a reasonable separation distance um, in this type of environment. There will be, as I said previously, an impact because there always will be an impact. But you have to assess it and be reasonable in making that assessment. And as I said before, it's got outline consent. So I'm sorry, members, um, we can't push back too far on this. And, um, and, and we certainly can't revisit the principle if you clearly are not happy with the layout and or the scale or the appearance of the properties um, or the landscaping um, or there is something fundamentally wrong with the access, then you need to very clearly articulate what that concern is. But you must be very careful not to stray back to the points of principle about whether this is infill and therefore contrary in principle to policy SP4 because that has already been determined, I'm afraid. Hopefully that's clarified things. I'm happy to take further um, questions and I think I can see a couple of people hands up already. Um, I'm just gonna ask one because I haven't asked one yet. Where the um, suds are going to be, is that lower down or is that higher up than the houses by the paddocks? And so that's within the open space where it does slope yeah. downwards and that's the re that's part one of the main reasons why the open space is in that location. Yeah, because water flows better downwards. Thank you. Um, Councillor Robbins. Thank you. Um, I thought the, it was the other way around. I thought that the open space was higher than the houses um, for some reason. Okay. Um, what was the question? Could we break with tradition? Because there's, there's pointless talking about, talking about flipping if... Um, Mr. And Mrs. Smith or Mr. Smith and partner doesn't would like. Can we break the tradition and ask Mr. Smith if he would prefer that or um, the uh, if we flipped it with the extra um, antisocial behaviour that, that may or may not bring? 
I'll, I'll seek legal advice on that, but I would have thought we are just looking at the plan before us and that is what we have to go on. Um, but somebody else might like to confirm that for me. Thank you. Um, I mean, whether or not there wishes to be an adjournment so we can um, speak with the applicant is, a, uh, sorry, the um, objective is another matter, but as um, as we've said at Council Crawford, we've got to determine the application in front of us. And therefore, if you wish to propose a deferment or refusal, then there would need to be good reason for, for, for doing so, good planning reasons for doing so. Pardon? For what reason? A toilet break or? <laughs> I will stop for a toilet break at three o'clock. Okay, because we just I just want to get the questions done. Sorry? What? Okay, then we'll have an adjournment for 10 minutes. Okay. Just for toilet break, comfort break, sorry. Yeah, so to help.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Can we start recording again, please, if we've stopped? And then we will continue the meeting. Um, Emma, did you want to come in? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I used the adjournment to um, just have a conversation with our legal advisor, just to make sure that I was giving you the right advice. Um, we need to be very clear if we are going to obtain the views of the um, neighbour. And the reason for that is that planning permission obviously runs with the land. It, it's not personal in this particular case. And we can't obviously control that the neighbour would stay in that house in perpetuity. They may sell it on um, in, in the future. So I have to urge you against taking into account his preference. Um, you have to assess it on um, proper planning grounds, on its own merits. Therefore, if you consider there to be an amenity impact and that uh, impact to be unacceptable, then fine. You can uh, make a decision whether to refuse it or to seek amendments. Um, but it's not a case of um, seeking something to um, appease and to deal with a preference for an objector or the neighbour um, where something in front of you is acceptable in terms of its relationship. Um, I would also remind you that this has been through the design pad, so I know there's some concerns about the design, but it has been very well and very closely scrutinised um, using our divine design pad service, so we have looked at it um, in great detail. Um, there was a question about the pumping station that's unanswered, so Ellie will answer that in a second. Um, it also complies with our adopted um, supplementary design guidance in terms of a design and amenity in terms of distances and space standards. And I just wanted to clarify one of the distances I gave you a minute ago, um, just to make sure it's clear in your minds, the distance. And it's the distance between the um, flank elevation, the side elevation, uh, which is the shortest side closest to development on the paddocks. The distance between the corner of that and the corner of the nearest property is 11 metres. I think I said five. I was actually thinking the distance of the boundary, but I've just, it's, had, it's been confirmed it's 11 metres from the edge of the building to the edge of the building at the angle, which is um, obviously officers considered to be acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ellie, if you could confirm the pump station. Thank you. Yes, so the pumping station is for the foul water drainage. Um, it is proposed to be adopted by Anglian Water. The reason for it is the topography of the site. Um, because of the slope downwards, it's needed to pump the foul water back up to, the, to where it's going to be connected to Swinstead Road. So that's the reason for the pumping station. Thank you. Next on the list was uh, Councillor Dilks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, clarify a bit of what um, um, Emma, the Assistant Director, was telling us. Um, I accept, of course, that the principle of development has been um, sorted and, um, you know, and, and has been passed. Is it me? Yeah. There we are. The other one seems to be working better. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, except the principle of development has been um, sorted. Um, but I just want to, uh, do we consider this, um, uh, what was approved, first of all, was it an affordable home scheme originally, or was it, you know, in the outline, is it just um, the principle of development that's, that's gone through? And um, is it, do we consider this, you spoke about SP4, um, do we consider this an SP4 site, i.e. edge of village? Um, so again, in relation to SP4, that relates back to the principle, and we already have the outline permission. So in this scenario, it's irrelevant. Um, and can you, what's the rest of the question? What was your first bit of your question, please, Phil? I'm awfully sorry, if I could just come back on that uh, point, it's not irrelevant with respect, because, yes, okay, if you want to say it is, Emily, Emma's no doubt advising it is, but um, my question is, you know, what hasn't been decided in the outline planning permission was scale. Scale is something we're considering today, and that is a... Um, an important part of SP4 is scale. So SP4 is surely not irrelevant. It's highly relevant when we're talking about the scale today of this application. And I'm 
I've got to say, given the given the area that it's in and the relationship with the what's already there in that area, it seems to me that the scale is not perhaps appropriate to this area. That's can I, can I perhaps you'd like to come back on that? Thank you. I can see him. Uh, Thank you. So scale relates to the height, width and the length of the buildings. Um, sorry? Uh, no, it's the height, width and the length of the buildings. That is what scale relates to. The original outline planning permission has a condition on saying that there should be no more than 25 dwellings on site. Um, so 25 complies with that. If you were to consider that um, 25 as proposed was excessive, you would need to have very good planning reason for, for um, explaining that. And you've also got to bear in mind, we do need to make efficient use of the land. Um, and obviously we do have a five year housing land supply to, to maintain. So um, you need good planning reasons for requesting a reduction in the numbers. So um, it's a case of then looking, if you've got concerns at each specific plot to decide which ones you were unhappy with and why. So the policy is um, in terms of SP4, it's an edge of settlement policy. It is largely about the principle because it's largely about whether or not we should consent the site in the first place. But there are bits in it that you do clearly need to, to have um, have regard to and they're also covered in other policies as well as in the national um, planning policy framework um, very simply that it should be well designed and appropriate in size and scale and layout to the character of the area so yes that that is relevant um, and, and obviously the policy is about intruding into the open countryside um, we've already consented the scheme so we've already allowed it an intrusion so it's it's that sort of subtle bits when um, we say that elements of that policy are not so they've already been dealt with. It's not that they're not relevant. They've already been ticked off by the, the outline consent. Does that make it a little bit clearer for you? Um, can I say, yes, it does. Thank, thank you for explaining that. Um, I, I, I didn't know how many, you know, there have been a number. I thought, we'd, you know, in the outline, it was just the principle, but I, I now um, accept that. Um, however, if... if, if, if <laughs> I still got, and it's the difficulty be, between the outline and the um, uh, and, and these reserve matters is um, also in SB four. SB four has to on edge of edge of village. SB four has to show um, uh, substantial community support or words roughly around that. Um, and I wondered, you know, is that is that re relevant or not at this stage? And then finally, I'll just add in this one, if I may, is um, SB4 also talks about affordable homes and, um, you know, has to, the number of, of, of homes that are being built has to be required, as I understood it, in, in that area, you know, um, uh, so is is that you know does it does it tick that box if I can say that thank you if I can come back on those points um, so in terms of the affordable housing I think probably you're looking at criteria on um, G to J which are the rural exception elements um, the affordable housing is secured via the planning obligation on the original agreement but obviously only requires the 40 percent whether the um, applicant chooses to make the additional 60 percent affordable is a matter for for them our requirement is the the policy um, obviously because we do require affordable housing you can give weight to the uplift um, as part of your um, planning consideration and planning balance um, but those other policy requirements about the local need a we've already dealt with that because we've dealt with it as part of the principle of development because it's secured in the original outline but secondly it relates to that other exception criteria and if you remember we had this at um clay pole a few um committees back where it's a very specific rural exception scheme so it's an exception to policy but there's a really good reason some very specific affordable housing needs for that locality and in terms of the evidence of support from the local community um, whilst it's part of the policy the policy is part of the plan it is part of something you you do need to take into account um, my interpretation is that's largely to do with the principle um, of development whether we should consent this scheme in the first place 
Um, and, and obviously we, we, we have consented it. Um, a number of the objections that are listed in the papers that have been raised, such as highways impacts are just simply not relevant. So um, there's still obviously a lot of angst about the original scheme, and that's something that you cannot take into account in a reserve matters application. Um, I think, I hope I've answered all of the points there. Um, I think you have, and, and, and thank you for that. But it does illustrate once again, you know, the difficulty that we have between outlines and reserve matters. And I've got to say, I think if we'd seen this, and perhaps we did, forgive me, but I, I don't recall the, 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 the original one, or perhaps I wasn't here. Oh, it's 2018, right. But, but I'm, I'm just saying, I just think if we'd, see, if we'd seen it like that and we'd had these um, objections today, I think we'd um, perhaps take a different decision, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Thank you. I'd, um, first of all, I'd just like clarity. Um, it was referred to um, um, by our, our, um, uh, our guest speaker um, that there was a planning application regarding the paddocks for it to become increased by bedroom. Can we just clarify, has that actually been approved or is that in the pipeline? Because that might have a bearing, the actual design of the paddock which has been, if it's been approved, um, it may not be that the paddock is overlooked, it might be the new development becomes overlooked. Um, I can answer this because I've got the plans in front of me actually, um, the power of, of the internet. Um, yes, it's already been approved. It was approved back in 2019. So um, there was consent to go up into the reef space. Um, and that's when I mentioned um, some dormers being proposed inserted into the window that's the approved scheme because I believe that's what the gentleman was referring to that he said was implemented um, and he was currently putting in those additional bedrooms up, up in the roof space so it's consented and would have been taken into account when we considered as officers considered the application. Um, okay in that case I have to say I think we should have had a visible a plan showing that because obviously the elevations may be, re may be relevant. Um, you're, there's a lot of difference between a ground floor bungalow and, and potentially two-storey building overlooking some of which will be bungalows. So I think that we should have seen, seen a plan including that application design because it may um, have, a, have a bearing. Um, my... Um, I understand where a lot of members are coming from with regards to concern about this site, but I also um, have, have I've got mixed feelings, to be completely honest with you. I've looked at the parish council. They're the local representatives for the community. They've not objected to this. The only concern they've raised was about the road being adopted. And to me, that says a lot. I, I always like to listen to what the parish council's got to say. Um, Councillor Robbins made the point, and here's a local member, that there is a need for affordable housing in this area. Um, by, um, by its nature, unless we can't come the day when it's all very heavily subsidised, that means it will be smaller. So if we kind of use some of the arguments that I've heard today, we'll never have affordable housing in rural villages because they're near bigger, grander, posher, detached houses which have which themselves sprung up on the edge of villages and at some point took somebody else's view um, uh, away. Um, uh, just to make, make that point. I do apologise. We are getting technical people to come up and have a look at the mics. I'll just... Um, so I, I looked... So to me, the key concern uh, um, is the relationships, the actual overall design. I... Um, I listened to the point about um, fire access and everything, and I understand Councillor Robbins might, might have a view, view on that if, if we progress, but um, my main concern then becomes the relationship between the site and the existing resident clearly surrounded by it, which is the paddock. And from what I can tell, now planning application has gone through, so in effect, the bedrooms will be raised up to the second floor. I am much more comfortable, actually, to, to support this going through. Um, so on, on that grounds, I would be minded to recommend um, approval of this because I can't see a strong enough arguments 
that counteract the benefit of providing affordable housing to people in this area so who just definitely need it and particularly I think the housing mix is very very important we're desperately short of bungalows we are desperately short of some of the larger houses and the fact that this is an affordable scheme um, and there has been although I have to say I don't think I've got a lot of choice really regarding the drainage I think this design is about the best you could get on this site without subsequent issues around drainage uh, emerging. So I, I would like to recommend a, approval. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Um, and I believe Emma wants to point out something so we can all understand it slightly better. Councillor Robbins. I've just got two quick questions before I can sum up and, and go to the vote, if you if like, Amanda Chairman. Um, the, the first one is just to confirm that the first um, plots, one, two, three, four, I think it's five dwellings, they're going to be the stone that are closer to the, the Corby Glen stone as we can get. Is that, is that right? Um, what's currently proposed is Fortecrete and stone. Um, but the additional condition and the additional items has left materials um, as condition, so details have to be put in. Um, this is largely because of it being an affordable scheme. It may have issues with cost if they were to be actual stone, um, but it would have the effect of stone if it was the Fortecrete and stone that was approved. And just as a last ditch, uh, we're just speaking to one of the other uh, members here, the, the committee members. Where, where um, 24 and 25 plots are, there seems to be like um, almost like a, a level, well, there is a larger garden on 25 than there is on 24. And there seems to be, I, I don't know how many metres wide that strip is, but there's a tree at the top. Um, I don't know if you can get the cursor out, can you, Ellie, on there? But yes, okay, that. Can, can that be a strip that is either sold to Mr. Smith from the developer or, or used as a buffer, further buffer, to, to either make the garden smaller, so therefore, uh, or, or move, the, move it back the, the requisite amount of metres to, to further the distance between the house and, and, uh, and the paddocks? Is that... Um, so selling any part of the site would obviously be a separate legal matter, be a private matter. Um, I did suggest to Mr Smith about putting trees along that boundary um, as a screening mechanism, but he was not too enthusiastic about it because it would cause a lot of light. Thank you, uh, Councillor Businessing. <coughs> Just a quick, quick one, Madam Chairman. I just want to, has there been a full uh, consultations and uh, by the local community? Have they got the approval and the support for this development? Again, surely that would have been with the first outline planning permission, so it's not relevant to this one. No, nor was I back then. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I've got Councillor Penny Milnes. Um, can I just mention this tandem parking that keeps cropping up? Um, it does cause problems. We've had it on other developments as well. Um, every one of these properties has tandem parking. I think it leads to a lot of rows as to who put their car in first and pulls it out first. Um, are we happy about this? Uh, you know, um, it does lead to people parking on the roads. It, it's been evidenced um, that um, that's what happens. Um, can I have some sort of clarification on what we, uh, any policies we have on this? 
Thank you, Councillor. Um, I understand what you're saying with the issue with tandem parking. Um, and I see the, the, I was talking to the urban designer about it and basically we don't have any specific policies to say that it's not acceptable. It, it does provide two parking spaces. Um, the reason, part of the reason that we don't um, enforce that it's side by side parking is obviously that would create more of a, um, you've got less opportunity for green space basically. And um, so it's getting that balance between having the two parking spaces and also having the street trees and the green spaces you've got around those parking spaces. That's, that's the reason why. Isn't that a question of density and, you know, how closely we're putting properties next to each other? In some ways, yes, but this is actually a low density scheme. Um, it's 25 dwellings within a 1.5 acre uh, hectare, sorry, site. Um, so this is low density. It's this difference between gross and net, isn't it, that we talk about? Um, you've got a lot of open space and the houses are close together uh, with certain issues that come from that. Um, I accept uh, that it has this outline permission. I'm not arguing with that at all. I just think um, it's the way this is laid out that is causing us some problems. And tandem parking is just part of a, a higher net density on the site um, when you compare it to all that open space. And the way it's pushed up towards the paddocks is equally part of that argument and also why we can't have a slightly wider buffer strip along the access road between the paddocks and the access road. So it is actually a bit of an issue of density, isn't it, in several dimensions. I think whether or not it, the density is appropriate is a matter for the planning committee. I mean, looking at it from my perspective, I think it's quite generously laid out. Um, certainly the original scheme plans that, that um, were submitted in 2018 um, showed 35 dwellings and dwellings over the entire site with very little amenity space and open space. So um, reducing the numbers certainly led, in my opinion, to a much better scheme coming in front of, in front of the committee members. Um, we don't have any parking standards, so we can't dictate, um, I'm afraid, that um, parking should be side by side as opposed to tandem. Um, I think you find it's quite normal up and down um, the country. I understand that it can lead to arguments, um, which is why there's a couple of spaces on there that have actually got three spaces, um, but we're not counting the third space. If you see, they're not numbered. So we would only have counted and they're sort of most bonus in that respect because um, two works, three almost certainly will lead to, to arguments, I'm sure. Um, if you feel that the parking arrangement is not adequate and therefore this is not um, going to adequately provide sufficient um, usable off-street parking, then you as members would need to evidence what the highway's impact and consequence of that would be. Um, you would need to be satisfied and provide the evidence to defend it as appeal if, if it went that far. Um, that, that by having um, parking spilled out onto the public highway, onto the, the road, that um, there would be a, a danger, a severe highway impact, um, which would ad be adverse in terms of the character of the area and to highway safety. Um, and that's the test that you would need to apply in terms of looking at the, the car parking. Um, in my experience, it is difficult to argue where you've got um, an arrangement like this. Um, had the parking been more convoluted, I might be minded to, uh, to agree that you've, you've, you've got questions that, that we'd probably need to look at again. But um, as I say, this is a relatively normal layout. Thank you. Councillor Robbins, thank you. Nick Robbins. Thank you. If we can go, uh, so I, I'd like to sort of propose uh, something um, and, and go to the vote, if I, if I may, Madam Chair. As I've said before, uh, and it's been banded around the room this afternoon, there is a need for affordable homes, and, and I do welcome the developer for lots of reasons um, for bringing the, the mixed tenure of houses, uh, and I think all of them that, that they are proposing to develop are needed in, in the area. Um, I'm buoyed by their um, 
uh, flexibility on, on on looking at the, the plans again and redoing um, the, um, the the layout of, of the of the development uh, in in line with the wonderful work that um, Richard Shaw has done as the urban designer, and and that's come about through through our own design guide, and it shows in here, and it shows in in the way the developer has has. Um, reacted to it and, and of course the MPPF as well uh, has some um, good design features in it, so the uh, tree-lined streets. Um, so I, I want to, um, and we have to take every development as it comes and, and I'm, I'm pleased that, um, that, the, that the team have taken into account Mr Smith's um, pending development with the top floor buildings uh, and, and they, they've looked at that and, uh, and, and adjust the development around it. So I, I would like to propose that we, um, uh, pass this um, development today um, with some conditions that um, I'm, I'm really buoyed by um, the, um, the, the the fact that they were, are willing to to hand over the street naming to the, to the parish council. I think it's really really important, and I really welcome that. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, I would like to see at least one uh, in the middle of the development a fire hydrant that they are. Um, groundwork level they are 1200 pounds to put in um and and that, that would certainly secure a water source if there's anything that's needed in the future um i would also like to in conjunction with myself as the ward councillor and and the, the chairman of, of the planning committee um the um the, the delegation to go through the construction management plan because th th there's a lot of stuff that still for, for me for the, the detail is still um outstanding um quite apart from the development which I'm, I'm more than happy to go ahead with um i'd like to see um before any decisions are reached the construction management plan um the landscaping plan the drainage strategy and maybe the materials as well before any decisions are reached in in uh, in consultation with uh, myself and, and the um the chairman of the planning committee if that's possible um so yeah i, I would like um as regards to parking, um, I, I agree with Assistant Director. We've seen problems with certain developments in Bourne with parking on the road um, and with the, the car park of two spaces per dwelling. That's more than the NPPF uh, recommends. And again, I, I'm welcoming that from the developer to uh, to actually take the, the cars off the streets. Um, so I would like to propose this, uh, that we approve this. Um. Can I just point out it already has been proposed by Councillor Morgan some time ago. Oh, right. Okay. But if you'd like to second it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, she did. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to, with, with those conditions in it, then, yeah, yeah. Um, if, if I could. Just to add, with the fire hydrant, it costs about, as Councillor Robbins rightly said, about 1200 to put one in sub subsequently, but it's about 750 to put one in during the development phase. So it makes financial sense for us to do it now. And there is a risk, actually, that the local authority would have to pay if a fire hydrant's needed later on as well. Emily, I believe you wish to come back. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we can draft some suitable word of condition to agree um, details and subsequent provision of a fire hydrant in a in a location wherever that may best be served. And we'd have to obviously take advice from um, the fire service on that one. In terms of agreeing details pursuant to the construction management plan, landscaping and materials, um, it's not something that we can add to the conditions, but we can deal with it in a different matter. I would suggest that um, the committee if minded um simply as a note um basically saying to, to myself and the planning officers that um we are only able to agree the details following consultation with the ward councillors and I, that's how i would phrase it the ward councillors rather than named councillors and the chairman of the planning committee and we deal with it that way not putting it into the specific wording of the the condition but it's in the resolution of the committee in the minutes are you okay? both happy with that Yes. Right, on that premise then, that we've got a proposer, a seconder, and what Emma has just said. Can I have all those in favour, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Did you make it eight? 
Thank you. Those against? Those abstentions, please. One, two, three, four, five. That has been passed. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, waiting and being with us. We will now go to agenda item five, and that is Adam will be presenting that. Thank you very much. And uh, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Yes, so the next item on the agenda is S210442, and this is a full detailed plan and application for demolition of existing buildings on the site and development of 11 residential dwellings. And this is at the Grantham College Building Department on Sandon Road in Grantham. And again, the application has been referred to committee as a major development. Sorry, Councillor Morgan. Thank you. I ought to declare a, I'm the ward councillor and secondly, that my daughter actually goes to Grantham College. She's a student there. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, so looking just at the uh, wider context for the site, it is a site of 0.4 hectares, so just under one acre. And uh, as I say, it's situated on the eastern side of Sandon Road on the eastern side of Grantham. Just having a zoomed in look there in terms of the aerial view of the site. It's a site that's bound by Sandon Road along this western side, um, beyond which you've got the Kesteren and Grantham Girls School. And then beyond that as well, you've got the college's main campus site. To the north, you've got Eggleston House and the um, Girls School playing field. And then to the east, you've got Garden Close and the Garden Close development here. And you've got Beacon Hillside and the annex of 17 Beacon Hillside as well along this eastern boundary. And then along the southeast, you've got Barracks Square. And then along this southern area here, you have the former Barracks Front. Um, as I say, there's a number of existing buildings on the site. Um, so just some photos showing examples of the buildings on the site at the moment. As you can see, they're fairly uh, functional in appearance, shall we say, for, for a college site. Um, mixture of scales between one and a half to two storeys. Um, again, formally, I say formally occupied primarily by the Grantham College. Appreciate that some of the buildings are still in temporary use by the college. Um, I believe that's as they're going through their process of, of reorganizing the campus, there are still some intermittent uses of the buildings on the site. Again, just to point out, yeah, that mixture of scale. So these are the existing buildings running along the eastern boundary of the site. So you can see the well, this is the eastern boundary here. You can just see the ridge point there of one garden close, which is in that northeastern corner beyond the site. And this is the side range of the former barracks. So you can see the windows just in that side elevation facing into the site there. And this is a looking out, so Sandon Road runs along the top here. And again, this is just looking, so with Sandon Road to your back, looking along that southern, so this is a southern boundary run along here. You can see the top end here, which is Barracks Square. And members will also be able to appreciate just looking at this point along this view, along the existing access, just this incline that you have raising. So it's about a two meter incline from the western boundary to the eastern boundary. So in terms of surrounding assets, just important to note that it is, like, as I say, located adjacent to Barrack Square and the former barracks, both of which are grade two listed. And the site is also located within the St. Anne's conservation area. 
Uh, in terms of the development that we've got in front of us, as I say, is a full detailed plan and application for the demolition of the existing buildings on the site and then redevelopment for 11 dwellings. Um, it was originally a scheme for 13 dwellings, but that has been reduced following engagement between the applicant and officers through it throughout the lifetime of the application. And just important for members to note that the site layout shown on screen now is an amended version in comparison to the one that it was contained in the original committee report. That effectively is an updated layout following the, the results of continued engagement between the applicant offices and the county council as highways and flood authority. In essence, the, the difference between the previous proposals described in the report and this shown on the screen is previously it was shown as a 1.8 meter wide service strip on both sides of the shared carriageway that has now been reduced. So the southern element of that service strip has been removed, um, essentially because uh, the county council came back to say that they felt it was excessive to have the service strip on both sides. Um, they viewed it as being over-engineered. Um, so as I say, that service strip would now be just along the northern side of the carriageway only. Uh, as you can see, in terms of the layout, you have effectively a courtyard arrangement along the rear element of the site and then a single row of three dwellings along the front of the site. Both, of, and again, that frontage element would be set back from the western boundary and slightly set back. So you can just about make out from the, the, this, this image on screen, just almost the, the staggered footprint that you would have then from the front range of the barracks, set back then slightly to the, the front row here of residential properties on the site. And then again, a slight setback then to Eggleston House. So you would have that staggered building line effectively as you move along Sandon Road. Uh, dwellings, all the dwellings are positioned to the north of the access. So the main internal access element shown in the, in the dark color on the screen, that would be an adopted access. And then the actual dwellings themselves would be served via private drive. So that's shown in, in brown here. And the access drive, it's, it's noted on the, on the actual access itself, is shown to be constructed with the blue clay paving and granite sets for the service strip. That's been updated following engagement between the applicant and the urban design officer during the application. In terms of parking provision, there's two parking spaces for the two and three bed properties and three parking spaces for the four bed properties on the site. Uh, looking at the actual boundaries and landscaping treatments, uh, the existing boundary wall at the front of the site, that would be retained with the exception of a small element that would have to be removed to facilitate the slightly widened access that would be created from Sandon Road. Um, and the grass verge and the frontage hedgerow at the front of the site would be removed. Um, there is an existing hedgerow within the site, broadly in line with the front row um, that would be removed as part of the development. The side boundaries for plot eight and plot nine, these are to be marked by a brick wall. And similarly, the, the side boundary of plot one, that would also be marked with a wall and then a feature tree in front of it. And again, this boundary here, you have a feature tree that would be situated at the end of this private drive. And the eastern boundary here with Beacon Hillside, that's to be reinforced with a close boarded timber fence. In terms of the mix of properties on the site, it is proposed to be a mix of three, there will be three two bed properties, two three bed properties and four four bed properties on the site. That would be mixed between, there's effectively five different house types on the site. So the first house type, house type A, which would be for plot two, three, six and seven. That's an example of the two and a half story, four bed dwellings. Um, they have an integrated garage and carport with a lounge above. And then the rear elevation to this property, so just shown in the bottom corner here, that has a window and patio door, well, window and door, apologies, situated at ground floor level and a single obscured window at first floor level, which would serve a family bathroom. House type B, which is for plot four and five. Again, that is a two and a half story, four bed dwelling, again, with the integrated garage and carport. You'd have two roof lights on the side elevations of those, each of each elevation over those side elevations. And the rear elevation of that property only has the patio doors at ground floor level. There's no 
windows above ground floor level for that property type. House type C, that is an example of the three bed property. Again, would have the integrated garage and carport feature. Um, they've been proposed to include roof lights in one of the side elevations. Um, and then you would have a rear elevation at foot, which includes habitable windows at first floor level, um, which would serve a lounge and second bedroom. And then house type D, this is plot eight and plot nine. Um, again, so that is an example of one of the two bed dwellings. Um, again, with the roof light features, um, the side elevations shown here, they would be obscure glazed windows. Now that um, introduction of windows has been brought in following consultation with the urban design officer. Um, those side elevations occupy a fairly prominent position because they would be fronting onto the access road. So the comments from the urban design officer was looking to add windows into that elevation to add visual interest. Um, again, but as I say, they would be obscured in terms of ensuring appropriate privacy for, for occupants of that property and in terms of the relationship with, with the, the former barracks wall to the south. And then finally, just in terms of house type E, this is proposed to be utilized for plot one. Again, that's another example of the um, two bed dwelling. Again, you've got the, just looking at the side of this rear elevation here, you've got the patio doors at ground floor level and the window at first floor level here that would be serving an internal um, hallway rather than a habitable room. And again, side elevation here, this southern side elevation it would be, that does again include windows for, for visual interest for again, what would be a fairly, fairly prominent elevation within the street scene. But again, they would be obscured just in terms of considering that um, privacy considerations. So in terms of coming on to, apologies, just one final thing is you'll notice in terms of the various elevations, there's these brick detailing elements in, in various elements of the ele elevations, primarily sort of in the front elevations of the respective house types. Um, the applicant has provided as part of the design access statement, just visual sort of illustrations of images of, of examples of that sort of brick detailing, just as an example of what that could look like. Um, so just included that for, for members awareness of just an appreciation of what that feature would be. So in terms of evaluating the scheme, as I say, Looking at the, the principal development on the site, um, it is a previously developed site, as I say, primarily formerly occupied by Grantham College's building department. Um, the buildings on site have been identified by the college as not being fit for purpose, and the site itself is now surplus to their wider land holding um, requirements. They are undergoing a process of redevelopment of the campus, um, so this land is, is seen as surplus to, to requirements as part of that, that redevelopment. As I say, appreciate members will have appreciated from the site visit yesterday as well that there is still some temporary use of the site by by the college. I understand that is sort of interim arrangement of the site as they're they're going through that redevelopment process. But as I say, in terms of considering the scheme, it does con consider to be previously developed land. The site would be vacated prior to to the development. Um, so in looking at the, the principle of development, it is a site that would be an opportunity to, to redevelop a brownfield site, provides additional housing within Grantham, um, and also provides an opportunity to, to provide an enhancement in terms of the street scene compared to the existing situation on site. So in that sense, it does accord with the overall principles of the spatial strategy in the local plan. Um, in terms of considering that principle of development, though, it is appreciated former college site or the most recent use of the site is as a college that then does have a, a purpose at, for serving the local community um, and also then has to be assessed against policy sp6 as well in that sense and in this case the applicant hasn't technically submitted information to demonstrate it, that it could be used for an alternative business or community use so there is a minor conflict in in that policy requirement as i say though in terms of considering it as a, as a policy as a whole the fact that it, this scheme formed part of the wider redevelopment of the campus office of you would be that there's a, there's a minor conflict in terms of absence of documentary evidence rather than conflict with, with what that policy is intending to achieve. So as a, as a matter of principle, it's considered principle development in this, in this scheme is, is suitable. 
In terms of looking at meeting all housing needs, as I say, it's within Grantham, so there's a 20% affordable housing requirement. Um, the applicants consulted with various registered providers. The council's partnership projects officer has also gone through and consulted with various um, registered housing providers. Conclusion from that consultation is that it would not be feasible to provide affordable housing on site because of the small number of units that would be required. So in this case, it's considered that a commuted sum is the appropriate way forward. That would be secured via section 106 agreement. Um, and current land values based on what the, the affordable housing need would be for and what the financial equivalent of provision on site would result in a contribution of around about £240,000. In terms of the actual overall mix of, of properties on the site, as I say, it's a mix of two, three and four bed properties. Um, appreciate that the policy references um, comparison against the strategic housing market assessment. And if you're looking at that in terms of the strict requirements of that, that assessment and what that recommends there are fewer three beds and greater four beds on this site than compared to what the recommended mix would be um, as i say in, in terms of what's set out in the report though it's important to note that that assessment or that recommended housing mix is is to be applied in terms of the district as a whole rather than necessarily being applied on a site specific basis um, and i think it's appreciated in this situation that with there are aware of a number of schemes in Grantham sort of town centre in the urban area recently that have focused potentially on the, the smaller property provision. So this is almost helping to counterbalance that effectively in providing a mix of, of family homes within, within the Grantham area as well. Um, in terms of design quality and the visual impacts, as I say, that has to be considered in the context of the existing buildings on site. Um, they are very functional appearance. They don't, they're not considered to make a positive contribution to the character of the area as it is. The applicant has engaged with, with officers and the principal urban design officer throughout, throughout the application. That has resulted in changes to the application throughout the lifetime. So as I say, the reduction in the number of units, changes in terms of the actual detailed house types, et cetera, which has followed that engagement. Um, and it's just worth noting for members information that following the publication of the report, we have now had updated comments from the urban design officer, um, which has included an assessment of the scheme against building for healthy life. And the result of that scheme is it would score nine green scores against criteria in three amber. So it's considered to perform well against that, that nationally recognized metric. Um, in terms of the scale of development, that's considered, in officer's opinion, that's considered to be appropriate when you, as I say, in terms of, what's on site at the moment and appreciating the scale of, of the built form in the surrounding area, including sort of, as members will appreciate from the site visit yesterday as well, the girl school opposite, the scale of development there, the height of the, the barracks, et cetera, that surrounding built form is considered to be appropriate. Key consideration for this application, as I say, is the impact on, on those surrounding heritage assets. Conservation officers' comments are, are set out sort of in full within the report, but the key thing to, to pick up out from those comments is that their opinion is that the existing buildings don't provide any positive contribution to the character or the setting of the conservation area. Um, but they do accept that because of the setting forward of development beyond the existing building line and the increased scale of development at the front of the site beyond the existing situation, apologies, beyond the existing situation, that there would be less than substantial harm to the setting of the barracks. Now that harm in terms of national policy then falls to be assessed against the benefits of the scheme um, as, as a matter of the plan and balance. So we'll come to that, come back to that point. Um, and as part of that plan and balance, the conservation officer has recommended that their view is the scheme would as a whole provide an overall improvement to the character and appearance of the area. In terms of assessing residential amenity and the impacts on the surrounding neighboring properties, as I say there's Eggleston House sort of to the Northwest of the site, You've got the properties on Garden close to the northeast, and you've got Beacon Hillside and, and Barrett Square as well surrounding the property, surrounding the site. As we've sort of gone through with the, with the last application, we've got the design guidelines now, adopted design guidelines that sets out the standards that are to be used for assessing those, those relationships between properties. Um, in terms of the way the application originally came in with that 13 dwellings, it was considered by officers that it didn't necessarily meet those standards that we had in place. Um, as I say, though, following engagement between officers and the applicant, the scheme's been amended to, with the reduction of, of the, the number of dwellings on site, which enhances the separation distances with the relevant properties. 
And again, in terms of the amendments, the actual house types to remove potential habitable windows that could have cause issues with overlooking. Um, so the view is now by officers that that, that would achieve the, the relevant standards. Um, as part of the submission, we have had various site sections submitted by the applicant. So just to show, firstly, the first one shows sort of the relationship of those properties on looking along sand and road effectively. So the former barracks front here, and it just shows the, essentially what would be a step down in, in the roofscape from, from the barracks, then along to, to the front of the development here. But we've also had site sections provided by the applicant looking at the various relationships. So the top site section here shows the relationship with the single story annex that is located at Beacon Hillside um, and then shows the relationship effectively with, with what would be the rear properties. So it effect, essentially shows as if you were standing on the southern boundary looking into the site and you'd have what is effectively the courtyard formation here and the front row development on this left hand side. I think it's maybe a little bit faint for members to see actually on the screen, but effectively shown on these site sections are the 25 degree standards contained within the design guidelines in terms of impact on um, overlooking and loss of light, etc. And also shows the relationship in terms of those separation distances. And then the bottom one, again, that just shows the relationship with, with the main property at Beacon Hillside. And then again, the relationship with um, Eggleston House here. And the applicants also submitted a site section just demonstrating the relationship between um, Garden Close and the most northern property on the site. Um, as I say, committee report sets out in full the assessment of, of the scheme against the, the, the relationships with those various properties. Um, but the view is that the scheme would meet all of the standards set out within the design guidelines. In terms of open space provision, um, there are financial contributions that would be made to enhance an existing children's play space provision. Um, a financial contribution is proposed within the 106 for that. And in terms of highways and drainage, um, again, just for members' awareness, since publication of the report, we've had updated comments from uh, the County Council as Highways Authority and Flood Authority. Again, confirming that they've got no objections subject to conditions um, which relate to a detailed drainage strategy. That is essentially already covered off by um, condition five within the report. And as I say, in terms of section 106 contributions, there would be contributions for this site towards healthcare, um, enhancement of the open space within the, or in terms of children's play space and the contributions towards affordable housing. So as I say, we have a scheme here which is which is accepted by the conservation officers causing less than substantial harm to the setting of the former barracks and that falls to be assessed against the public benefits important obviously for, for members i'm sure they're aware that there is also primary legislation in terms of the listed building conservation areas act which requires the planning authority to have special regard for the desirability of preserving the listed buildings that means we have to give substantial significant weight to, to protecting those heritage assets and in terms of adverse impacts, as I say, there is also a minor conflict with policy um, SP6, which falls to be considered against the scheme. But in terms of balancing against that, benefits for the site would, as I say, would involve the reuse of, of previously developed land, the opportunity to improve the character and appearance of the area, and as well as that in terms of boosting the supply of housing, etc., cetera, um, from, from delivering additional housing. You've got the... the the standard economic benefits associated with the development in terms of the actual build out of the scheme, et cetera, and future occupation, what that would do in terms of utilizing local services, et cetera. And there's also environmental benefits associated with the scheme in terms of um, subject conditions with the ecological mitigation plan, et cetera, that would assist in securing a biodiversity net gain on the site. Um, so officers' assessment of the scheme would be that the public benefits in this case would outweigh that harm. And therefore, the recommendation would be to authorise the director to grant plan of mission subject to a Section 106 agreement to, to secure the necessary contributions and subject to conditions. Um, just for members' awareness in terms of conditions, um, 
it is proposed to amend condition two in the report, which is the approved plans condition, just to reflect the change to the site plan and the house type floor plan, one of the corresponding house type floor plans, which is coming as I say has been presented. And uh, following one of the concerns I appreciate from members in terms of site levels, also proposed to include an additional condition requiring submission of details for finished floor levels um, as part of the development as well. So I will hand back to you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much for that uh, very full description and presentation. Um, now, can I ask uh, Michael Ellison to come and uh, have his three minutes, please? And please start when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, please look at the plan on the screen whilst I speak on behalf of my family. We live at Beacon Hillside, but bounds the eastern side of the site. I'm a practicing and chartered architect of over 50 years experience, and I've been involved in hundreds of planning applications, including an award-winning housing scheme incorporating a list of building. I'm surprised this application has reached the committee due to a major omission in the information submitted. No topographic survey has been provided. As a result, all site sections show the site to be flat. This is not so, as there is a significant slope of around three metres, possibly two. Therefore, the site sections and to a lesser extent plans are no more than pretty pictures, works of fiction. The mentions and angles shown are totally unreliable. The scheme as presented therefore cannot be built as shown. Our trees and boundary are not shown as described as they really are. And this includes trees that don't exist, totally misleading. In the light of the above, some of the agenda report by necessity cannot be relied upon and approval could be deemed unsafe and open to challenge by judicial review. The design, we have four main areas of concern. The proposal is for a solid wall of houses, nine and a half meters high, with three stories of living accommodation, only eight meters, or is it seven, from our western boundary. This will cause severe overshadowing of our garden and dieback damage to our trees, as happened when the two-story plumbing building was constructed adjacent to the corner of our garden a few years ago. Furthermore, we will lose all the evening light in the garden, making the whole proposal oppressive, exacerbated by the dark brickwork, and will dramatically damage the amenities we currently enjoy. There will be a severe loss of privacy from the second floor roof windows to us, both in our, the garden and our annex where our son who's recovering from a long illness lives. The back-to-back -back distance between our annex and plot one is too close and should be at a very minimum 28 meters, not the 17 meters as shown. See report 7.7.3. Due to the slope, despite what the agenda report states 776, the screen wall mooted by the applicant will not prevent car headlights shining straight into the windows of our annex and also 11 Barrack Square, causing significant nuisance. In conclusion, notwithstanding our request to reject this proposal, if the committee are minded to approve the scheme, we request a decision be deferred until a topographical seconds. survey is undertaken and plans and sections amended accordingly and resubmitted. Many thanks for the opportunity to speak. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. If you could just turn off your microphone. Thank you. Do I have any, Councillor Morgan? Thank you, if I may, through your chair. Um, can you just clarify, um, you mentioned the um, potential overlooking. Um, can you just, I don't know if it's possible to indicate where, exactly where you think that concern will come from? Sorry, there are roof windows on the houses um, they are at an angle, admittedly, but uh, as they are three-storey buildings 
effectively in living accommodation. They're called two and a half, but that's a misnomer. That is just the scale of the building. But um, you can still look diagonally. When the uh, college plumbing building was got planning permission, there was a window that was at right angles to our garden, but it was agreed that that would have uh, obscured glazing because they could look out of that window straight into our garden. Our garden boundary is over 200 feet long, and therefore anybody can have an angle into our garden. Thank you. Could you just, thank you. Quick one. Can you clarify if the overlooking would be into any living area, as in within your house or the annex? It would be into the annex because my son lives first floor level and it's got the sloping roof lights. So you would look into his roof lights, they look down into his roof lights. Thank you, do I have anybody else? No, thank you very much, Mr. Ellison. And uh, next I will call Mr. Chris Lindley, the applicant's agent, if you'd like to come up, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. I'm Chris Lindley. I'm a Chartered Town Planner from RGMP. I'm here on behalf of Grantham College, who are the applicants and the promoter of this development. I must start by fully endorsing the robust and very thorough recommendation to approve the planning application for residential redevelopment of the land off Sandon Road. The proposal before you today reflects a period of constructive work with your officers which has seen views taken on board and positive changes made. As discussed in the report and presentation of the proposal, we have a site that is not without constraint. It's located within the St Anne's conservation area and there are listed buildings nearby. There are also a number of existing residents adjoining the site, so protecting their amenities are very important too. On the flip side, we have a fantastic opportunity here to regenerate a previously developed site which has been judged to make a poor contribution to the character of the area. We need to provide much needed new homes to deliver an important capital receipt to support the ongoing development of the college. These factors very, weigh very heavily in favor of the development and significantly outweigh any identified harm. I'm pleased to confirm that following close and positive work, our team has been able to resolve concerns raised by consultees and officers the scheme has seen a reduction in dwelling units, and we've come to a consensus on the design of the dwellings. The submitted plans are considered to be of an appropriate appearance, design, scale, layout, height, massing, and materials when viewed in the context of the existing site characteristics and the surrounding built form. Careful analysis of the scheme, the application of the 25 degree and 45 degree tests and separation distance requirements of council guidance confirm that alongside design measures, no unacceptable adverse impact on residential amenity would occur. The plans are based on an up-to-date topographical survey that's been provided to the local planning authority. Redevelopment of the site would not have a material impact on the loss of educational facilities because the development of the land will release a capital receipt to help realize the continued transformation of the college site as has been long supported by the council through planning approvals, including the overall master plan, and more recently, the energy center building. This gives rise to a significant public benefit that weighs heavily in favor of the application. On the basis of that the reasonable professional judgment of your officers is sound and not challenged, I commend the recommendation before you and respectfully request you resolve to approve this application with appropriate conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I have a couple of questions. Uh, Councillor Phil Dilks, did you have one? Thank um, you. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Ma Madam Chairman. Thanks for your um, presentation. Um, 
I went on this site visit yesterday and um, I note at uh, twice in the report, it's mentioned that the site was um, previously occupied by the college, uh, by, by the construction department. Um, quite clearly, it's, it's still occupied by the construction um, um, department. It, it was very busy, I thought, you know, there was classrooms with, you know, kids in there being trained in whatever skill it was, we didn't, you know, didn't actually see that, of course, uh, but it was, it, it was quite, it's quite clearly quite busy. So I, I'm, I'm also concerned, of course, that as a planning, as a qualified planner, you, you'll be aware that we've got in our local plan, um, uh, SB6, is it? Uh, I don't mean SB6, um, that says that the change of use of all community facilities, which we take this to be, would result in the loss of community use, which would, would result in the loss of community use, will be re resisted unless it is clearly demonstrated and supported with evidence, with documentary evidence, that the existing use is no longer viable. Well, we haven't seen any of that um, documentary evidence, if there is any. Could you tell us why we haven't seen any of that? Um, it just seems, and it could I give you the opportunity to sort of tell us exactly what is going to happen to those courses that you currently offer on the site, whether in plumbing, bricklaying, um, uh, and, and, other, and other, other building skills. What concerns me is the impact, the possible impact of loss of those facilities um, when you know this area, Grantham area, is gonna need thousands of houses built in the next 20, 30 years, Who's going to build them if we don't train those, um, if we don't have a construction um, uh, facility such as we have at the moment? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor, for the questions. Um, I'll take them in order. Um, the point on the site being uh, used still is, is unfortunate that it's in the report. Um, and that is something that I sought to clarify with your officers earlier, earlier on this week. And, and Adam has has made reference to that in, in, his, in his presentation to you um, today. I think it's, it's fair to say that the college have to be agile in terms of how they allocate and use their spaces. Um, as I referred to, there's a, an approved master plan for the site that's in, that's in outline form. And you've, you've had applications before you for, for new buildings and, and new uses within, within the site. And, um, they, as I say, they have to be agile in terms of how they use the buildings. It varies with, with time. I've clarified it with the college. There is some vacant space within the, within the buildings. Some buildings are being used. That will change as the site transforms and, and develops further. In terms of your second point, in terms of um, policy SP6, um, I won't stray too much into planning legislation, but obviously I'm bound to give my qualifications. Um, Yes, uh, decisions should be made in accordance with the development plan, um, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. And that will have been weighed by your officers in making the recommendation today in terms of balancing the requirements for further evidence, given that this is a, a unique development that supports an existing educational use and creates a capital receipt that will further support educational uses. So your officers, without wishing to put words into their mouth, I'm sure they will respond further in due course, is that they've weighed the requirements for further documentary evidence and exploring it and deem that it's not required for the purposes of their recommendation today. Yes, th thanks very much for that. Um, I just want to go a little bit further then and just, just ask you to, to tell us, and I appreciate it may not be your area of expertise, but will these courses that are currently being offered and, and young people are clearly, and perhaps not so young, are clearly taking them up right now, will all of those courses be offered in this new build campus, you know, whenever it comes? I'm not, I'm not here to talk about the syllabus of the, <laughs> of the college, um, but presumably all of the uses that are be, being accommodated in there for the learners will be, will be relocated into other 
purpose-built, modern, more energy efficient uh, buildings that reflect, of course, how their courses change and how their teaching changes as well. Clearly, you've seen a site of some age when you've, when you've been out on, on site, and that's the very nub of the master plan to, to improve the environment for learners. Thank you. Um, we've reached yeah, our time. Can I, may I just, Madam no. Chairman, would I just close this with, with one? Can know, I very... just, no, because we time limits. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologise. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were just going. Me... No. May I just it? continue with a short? Oh, sorry. I'm happy to support yes. that. Yes. Can we just have a quick vote? I'm sorry. Yeah. Everybody's happy. Right, we'll extend. I suggest um, till the end of business. Thank you. Carry on, Councillor Dillon. You're very kind. Thank you. Apologies for that. Um, Thank you for that. But I am, you know, SB6, if we look at the top of page 75, and I've looked it up um, in the in the local plan, you know, the, the bullet point at the top, item D, says, you know, the potential impact closure, we, we have to demonstrate that consideration has been given to the potential impact closure that, that it may have on the area and its community. And, and that's what I'm concerned about is we haven't had any of that. And we seem to be just be saying, oh, it's only a minor problem, uh, the local plan, but let's not worry about that. Let's, let's sort of move on. And, you know, most of the time we're told, oh, well, here's the local plan. We've got to stick to, stick to this. Well, you know, we can't have it both ways. Thank you. I'll get Emma to come in on that point. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure Adam can fill in if there's subsequent questions and things in terms of any evidence that we've seen, just to give you some reassurance. Um, the policy, obviously, you, you're very familiar with what the policy says. You've, you've just read it out. Um, really, it's a matter for um, you committee members um, to make a balanced decision. Um, the case officer has made his recommendation. It's an unbalanced decision. He acknowledges there is a, a minor conflict with the policy. And in his opinion, um, which is why we've got the recommendation in front of us, that harm, that conflict is outweighed by the benefits of the development. It is perfectly reasonable and legitimate for the council to, uh, the committee members, sorry, to take a different balanced view as long as you express and set out why you've reached that balance. So really that is a matter for your judgment. If you're satisfied with the information we have in front of us and the harm is outweighed, the conflict with the policy is outweighed, then um, that's fine, you'll accept the recommendation. If you are not, then clearly you'll come to a different view. So I think it's a matter of your judgment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll go to Ian, I believe you had a question for the... Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I've got a number of questions, actually. First of all, thank you to Councillor Dilts for, for his questions. Thank you to Adam for, for the uh, presentation and, and through yourself, Madam Chair. Um, yes, various questions. Um, uh, do you want to take these one at a time? Uh, Mr. Lindley, then, Mark, Mark, okay, okay. Um, well, first of all, I have to say from the outset, um, we we know that education is a material planning consideration, as outlined in the National Planning Policy Forum, which is issued by the government, the Ministry of Housing, Communities, and Local Government. It clearly states in here. There's two there's two sections in there. I can I can read those out if you so wish, but it clearly states education is a material planning. Uh, consideration. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to ask, on the site visit that we had, um, none of the, the planning members actually viewed the insides of the building, those many, many of those buildings there. Can you tell us uh, how many classrooms there are currently on the site and what are they actually used for? That's my first question. If you'd like to answer that in the comment. Uh, not as we sit here, no. Okay, right. So that tells me a lot. Um, I thought you was the agent for the for the for the college, um, and therefore I thought you'd be um, up, um, the guy to, to ask all the questions for. This. Yes, certainly. Um, but I can tell you that approximately thirty percent of the space um, within the overall is is currently is currently un, unused. Okay, I'm assuming that thirty percent is the plumbing department. Um, how many students are currently undergoing a course on the site, please? I can't tell you that. Okay, well, can I enlighten you then? 
Um, there are approximately 30 in the joinery department and approximately 30 in the bricklaying department. So that's probably 60 students, probably twice as many people as in this room at this moment in time. Um, my next question. As the construction department, has it been making a financial loss and will, it, will construction courses cease to exist at Grantham College if this application is passed today? Uh, and if not, where will the courses be relocated to? Because it's been intimated that, that these courses in these big buildings, which are, are, uh, were built for their purpose, could you tell us please where they will be relocated to please? I'm here to comment on the planning merits of the scheme that's before you at the moment, not the operational requirements or operation of the college. Okay, uh, okay thank you for that. Um, could you tell us then, please, when do you envisage that the work will commence to, um, to demolish the current buildings on the site if this application is passed today, please? I'm sure that's something that you could probably comment on. Well, that depends on a number of different variables. It depends on the um, who takes forward the scheme in terms of its, con who its construction, whether the college work with a, um, a development partner, the marketing process, the length of time to discharge pre-commencement planning conditions. There are a number of variables. I can't give you that information today, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. My final question, Madam Chairman. Are you aware that there are parking issues within this area? Uh, there's a small estate across the road from the ambulance station um, that students uh, use um, for the, the main part of the campus. Um, that also, um, also these side roads they used used um, for the uh, local schools that's there. Um, and I suggested that once news gets out that this this parking place is available um, on this site when you when they've been redeveloped. I think the students will be uh, will be keen to use them. Are you, are you aware of that issue? Thank you. The highways implications of the scheme have been judged by the highway authority. Um, and if there was a parking issue or an off-site highways um, issue, a residual issue, that would have been identified as part of the consultation process and would be communicated in the recommendation before you. Can I just thank Mr Lindley for, for, the, uh, for his responses? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Morgan, please. That, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd just like to ask the fundamental question, um, which was raised by our earlier speaker, and that is why there was no topographical survey done and why the plans that were presented to us all show a flat elevation which is inaccurate, according to, to his own um, measurements and study and his 50 years, I think he said, experience. The scheme has been based on a topographical survey, a copy of which has been provided to the local planning authority. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I have to say I've actually been or contacted SK prior to this meeting and I have not had a response to that effect. So I would appreciate if the officers subsequently could comment on that. Um, picking up the um, loss of the amenity, um, uh, with regards to the use, the current use of that site, you said that you, the college, you, you actually... May I say earlier, said in your speech that there, we should give a lot of weight to the relationship with the college and the education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my understanding is, however, that we actually um, should not give undue weight to any individual. We should be, in effect, disregarding who the applicant is. What we need to do is focus on the application before us and the merits of the application. Could I have clarity around, around that as well, please? If it comes from our, our gentlemen or, or again from our officers. Um, the reason I'm saying that is how much weight do we do we actually should we actually give to the fact that it is, is a local college? Um, can you clarify, you mentioned, because I am concerned about a point you made that may be a bit misleading, 
You mentioned that the students will be learning in a better environment, um, a more pleasant environment, and I am aware there is new development going on actually on the college site itself. But what's not clear, and I don't know if you can answer this based on some of your earlier responses, that the students who are currently receiving their education on this site will be benefiting from those new amenities, um, i.e. construction courses within a better environment. That's, can you tell us? The references that I made in my address to yourselves relate to the, the planning history of the, of the wider college site and the endorsement of previous planning applications by, by the council. Um, it's not for me to talk about the specific college operations themselves in the nature that you and, and your colleague have, have, have talked about. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harish Nursing. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Through you, can I have a question to Mr. Lilly. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. I would be very uh, for, uh, for answering our questions. Also, thank you very much, Adam, for the pre presentations. I would like to go back to um, concerns about the climate change mitigations and that. Uh, you're very kindly on paragraph on page 88, and I say that you have uh, provided with regard to the minimizations of water consumptions and also provision of electric cars. Now, I wonder if you would consider pushing a bit forward, you, as you said, uh, you're only the solar panel or photovoltaic cells panels will be installed only on a few selected properties. I wonder, will it be possible for you to extend it to all the, the properties? Or consider that? Um, that is likely to because, be because of the um, orientation of of the buildings and the, the potential for solar gain to be um, achieved with all of the uh, solar panels on the faces of the of the roofs. Um, there is a condition on the on the permission that uh, that supports the recommendations of the energy statement that's been that's been submitted, and and we think that that is an appropriate response to the climate change agenda in terms of the policy and the legislative requirements at the moment. Uh, but uh, photovoltaic cells is not necessarily depend on the actual direction where the sunshine is coming, it's down to where the light is. If during the daytime you've got the light, it will generate the necessary voltages in there. So I think the most of the building, no matter where the orientation is, I'm pretty sure there will be plenty of lights within this. If that can be considered, that will have within our own carbon footprint. I think that's perhaps something for your officers to pick up in terms of their consideration of conditions and, and, and informatives. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bryce Oxley, please. Hello, thank you, Chairman. Um, I wonder if um, you could explain to me on page 115, um, the, the section through uh, BB. And, now, this might just be the way that architects are pr present things, which I'm not particularly familiar with, but I went on the, um, the site visit yesterday and I asked Adam about the slope um, and Adam thought that they weren't levelling, weren't levelling the land, that the slope was going to remain. Um, so just following Councillor Morgan's comments, really, um, is there an accurate um, graphic uh, including that slope? Because this would seem to be a, an approximation at best, really. And also, does the annex to which the, the gentleman was referring, does that annex... Is that that is that the building on the on the just if you could just explain that graphic to me, I'd be very grateful. Perhaps it might be helpful if we had it up on the screen because I don't think my copy is a great deal better than yours. I think that section does show the change in change in levels through the through the site based on the based on the topo survey that, that underpins the plans. Um, are you referring to the, the bottom one? Yeah. 
I think the gentleman's annex is on the on the top picture is there. So you can see, but it, I, I quite agree with you. It does look like it's all on one level because there's no variation in the heights of the buildings, is there? So I think if I'm reading it right, that the one on the right is Beacon, which is that one there, and the one on the left is Eggleston, which is that one there. And then these are the two banks of houses in between. So there would appear to be quite a bank there. And I'm just wondering if there, were, if there is that graphic available showing the slope. No, I don't think there is at the moment. Thank you. Sorry, Jim, but am I... Am I understanding that correctly, that that is flat, whereas there is, in fact, a slope? That would be my understanding, Councillor, yes. Um, and that's part of the reason why we have suggested that additional condition to deal with finished floor levels, etc. That would then have to be based on the topographical data um, to show that, that potential difference in levels. If I may, but... Can you tell, are we able to make a judgment on sight lines based on that graphic? So in terms of the, the, the assessment within the report itself, that is partly based on, on those site sections, but it is also based on our understanding of the site, having visited the site itself and using the appropriate distances available to then calculate the, the separations, et cetera, and those angles. So, so I think it's one of those situations, Councillor, where yes, a topographical survey would, would have been beneficial in terms of having that available at the time to make the assessment, but we are in a position to make an informed assessment without it. Thank you. Um, I've got somebody else to ask first. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Um, Sorry, it, it was whilst we were talking about... All right, OK, quickly then. If, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, Phil, I thought the land was sloping up towards the annex, which I think is on the right. I might be quite wrong. That I, I thought that was the front of the site and that was the back of the site on the upper thing, in which case the um, third um, section of housing would be two metres higher than the front. And therefore, um, two, two metres is like six foot, it's almost uh, a room, isn't it? So that's how I saw it, not that it's lower, unless they're going to dig the site out, which is something we don't know, is that correct? Um, I, I, I think, sorry, Councillor Mills, you may be right that the property closest to the annex is would effectively be on the same level as the annex because it slopes up towards it. What you would then have is the first two buildings closer to the road on, on, a, on a lower level. Um, so so may, maybe the property that's closest to the annex, that's a, a, a true reflection of the, 
you know, from my recollection of the site, as you get towards the back of it, the, the level as proposed is similar to the level of the neighbouring property in the annex. It would be those front two buildings that would be on a lower level. Thank that makes you. Sense. Uh, Councillor Nick Robbins, did you have your question? Right, okay. Um, do I have any further questions for the agent? Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, no. Quickly, then. I was just going to ask a very quick one. Um, electric car charging points, if, have you got a, a number? Is it every house or one point? It will be for each house, yes. Sorry, I haven't got my mic on. Uh, debate. The debate yes. as well. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right. yeah. So, okay. Councillor Selby, thank you. Right. First of all, can we can we go back to the slides, please, of, of the um, of the photographs that you took, please, yesterday, if we may. Just to clear this this one up first. Okay. Start with that one, if you like. Yes, you can start with that one, if you like. Right. Um, I can tell you what every single building. Uh, is used for Madam Chair and that particular silver building there that's the former plumbing department and just to the right of it upstairs there there is actually three large uh, classrooms okay uh, um, just the little doors at the side there they're actually an office there uh, for um, and also um, recreation for the for the staff okay next that one there uh, three classrooms there Madam Chairman as you can see there and if you note the building itself, very solid building, very fit for purpose, I would suggest. Next one, please. That one there, you're looking at Brick Lane, uh, those very large buildings there, their construction for the, all the brick layers, um, and uh, they need all the space they can get in there because uh, they do a lot, of, a lot of, it's a shame we didn't look inside the buildings, but those buildings there, they're all, they're all Brick Lane. And at the back of one of them, there is a, um, an area for plumbing as well that, that used to be for the plumbing okay um doesn't give a yeah it's not really i, was, I wanted the buildings it's, it's another yes um this you've actually yes that one there that is actually the um for the joinery department and there's a there's more office of more um, office space at the back there as well so uh, yes that's that is the joinery department Okay, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, begs a question as to why Grantham College management are closing a thriving uh, department. In recent years, they closed the popular plumbing department on the site, and that for me was the thin end of the wedge towards closing this site. Asked South Stephen uh, District Council corporate plan, key actions, it states on page seven. And it goes against the corporate plan. This does. It states that um, we will work with education providers to increase opportunities, increase opportunities for local learning and apprenticeships in the district. Reference our South Coast Stephen District Council Economic Development Strategy on page three. It states uh, strengthening skills progression. Reference uh, MVQs three and four. Uh, Grantham College Department. Um, I've actually won numerous, numerous awards in the joinery department for the students, uh, the skills that they have, 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 have learned. They're not just for the workplace, uh, but they're skills for life. They really have, they've won some excellent, excellent uh, trophies, they really have. <laughs> um, it, the local plan has been described as a major development. This is not not on the local plan as a site, allocation, a site for allocations. Uh, reference the local plan on page 94. As I've mentioned earlier, the uh, national policy um, 
National Planning Policy Framework on page 81, page 23, re reference uh, construction of students. Uh, it goes against that policy. It goes against the National Policy, uh, National Planning Policy Framework on page nine uh, with regarding strategic policies. Madam Chairman, the students, they contribute greatly towards the town centre and its economy, helping, a, helping a, a town to thrive, our town to thrive. And this application is another nail in the coffin of the economy for our local, uh, local high street. Uh, those classrooms that we, that we saw, uh, students, that, they were, those, those classrooms were packed with students. This is, this is a, a, a thriving uh, site, I suggest you. Uh, and, and whilst we're building thousands of houses in the Grantham, uh, Grantham area, do, the question is, do we need an additional 11 properties, 11 properties, and do these 11 properties outweigh the need uh, to help our students, hundreds of students in, in years to come? That's the question. That is the big question. Um, and I, I feel it's extremely short-sighted uh, to close a construction department at the college. Education, as I've said, is a material planning consideration. I ask whatever happened to the big plans for expanding the college um, on the old police station site. Well, we know what happened there. It was sold off for housing. Uh, we know we bought the land, don't we? Uh, now, selling off the, the construction site, this is becoming a mirror image, a mirror image of our hospital. It's been chipping away at it until there's nothing left of it. And this begs some serious questions, in my view, for the, for the senior management at the college, why they are taking such a retrograde, retrograde step. Uh, Madam Chairman, as you, as you can tell, I'm not happy with this application whatsoever. It goes against many, many policies. As it's been spoken about, it goes against SP6 or this question um, debate on, on that. Um, it's been um, mentioned by a gentleman about the uh, topographic survey not, uh, not being undertaken. Um, well, Madam Chairman, I think I'll leave it to that for the time being, if I may. Um, I, I, well, I tell you what, I'm going to propose refusal, Madam Chairman, on the grounds of, of the policies that I've mentioned. You might want to wait on that bit at the minute. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you. What, I'm, what I've heard so far from... I'm just, thank you. Just wait a minute. You might agree with me. Um, what I've heard so far from the questions to the agent, I don't think we've got all the information we require. So I propose that we um, defer this application to allow further information to be sought from the college to support their application regarding the need, where the students will go and how this fits in with the overall master plan of the college and clarification over the levels on the site um, in existing proposals. Um, so, oh, one second. Right, everybody wants to second it. Um, <laughs> Councillor Robin. I'll just ask a question, if I may. If, if I'm not present at the next meeting, what I would like to do, if the committee are mindful to approve the application, um, can you condition it or something or whatever you want to do to it to, to, um, to protect the Section 106 contributions? Because actually... This looking through here, this has got abnormal costs written all over it because there's contamination in the land, which is probable, but it hasn't been included in the cost of construction. What I don't want to see is, oh yeah, loads of land. So we, we've got abnormal costs and the 255,000, £211.50 disappears. So there's no education, there's no uh, play areas. So I'd, I'd like to I'd like to condition something that actually that the 106 contributions are ring fenced or something if you like, but if they if there are abnormal costs, that's absolved into the cost of the construction, not at our cost. Um, yes and no. Um, so if the committee was minded to approve, then um, there'd be clear heads of terms set out in that resolution. So it's X amount towards education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we would then make sure that the legal agreement is completed to secure those. Um, where it's not being suggested that there is a viability, abnormal costs, et cetera. But um, obviously, sometimes you don't know these things until you put a spade in the ground and, and find out what's underneath the, the ground. So they can be abnormal and unforeseen. What we can't do 
um, is we can't prevent the applica applicant coming back to us in the future to ask the question about um, can he renegotiate the section 106. We're not compelled to agree where a section 106 planning obligation is less than five years old, but we do have to be reasonable. So we can't just say no, um, but we would expect evidence and information. And clearly if a scheme was um, in at risk of not being delivered at all, because there were abnormal costs, um, we would need to consider our position at that point. So um, in, in, in short, no, we can't put a condition on that because we can't prejudice or fetter our discretion to make a future decision um, regarding the 106 and the viability, but they would have to formally come back and, and ask us to renegotiate or put a new planning application, and we'd consider that on its merits at that particular time. Um, but to date, if we were minded to agree um, in the future, we would secure what's on offer at the moment and what we wanted because there's no suggestion of viability. Thank you. Thank Did you, you want to come back? Yes, yeah. okay, thank you for that. That clarification, but um, it, it's clearly in, in the in the agenda pack today that there is a chance of it being um, ground contamination, which then will be abnormal costs. Um, if we are minded to defer it, could we ask the applicant to go away and a desktop survey of how much it would be to you know to, to, to build that into the cost, and then they can come back. So look, look, you know, it will be a I don't know a hundred thousand foot figuratively speaking. Um, it's not viable, and then bring a scheme back that is viable, rather than because because this committee is, is is guilty for years and years of of of, uh, of taking the the um, discharge of, of developers' liabilities and saying, oh, yeah, we're really cross, but okay, fine. Well, well, that, that doesn't that work, does it really? And it shouldn't work anymore. If schemes can't, if you buy land or know that land is contaminated, well, don't develop it, or you mitigate that development by. Um, by moving the development around or, or putting more or less on it or, you know, to try to absorb those costs into, into it. I, I don't see why people should be disadvantaged by, um, by having um, no contributions to the education and, and all the, you know, the, the, this, this, this quarter of a million pounds. That's a lot of money that would be disappeared because somebody thought, well, yeah, actually, do you know what, it, it was contaminated and, and we knew it was contaminated and didn't actually allow for that. So, so I think in, if we are going to defer it, bring back, the new figures to say is it viable or not? I mean, we can certainly ask the applicant to provide a viability assessment if they believe that it wouldn't be viable. Um, as part of the submission so far, there has been a desk based ground investigation. So clearly, the applicant should at this B stage have some indication of what they believe is below site and what implications that would have. Um, yeah, so there's, there's certainly a degree of understanding that you've probably had to date so certainly in terms of whether they're comfortable with the heads of terms at this stage and looking to enter into the agreement on the basis of the contributions that we've got in that report you would expect that the applicant has got some consideration as to whether they think they could feasibly do that based on the work that they've done so far thank you uh, councillor morgan and then i think we will go to the vote because it has been proposed and seconded by members Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, well, first of all, Councillor Selby made a proposition and was then told to hold forth, and his was to refuse. Um, and the way it currently stands before us, I was willing to second that. Um, I am mindful, however, of your proposal to defer, but I, what's concerning me is we've actually, I a, totally support all of Councillor Selby's comments, um, as a local councillor, I've been, I'm hugely concerned at the loss of this amenity. I think also we have to consider where else would that go if it's not there? And, and without doubt, there's a, there's a lack of communal space within Grantham Town Centre. And, cer and certainly if the college has sold off parts of its land, it's reducing the amount of space available for something like this. As, as Councillor Selby quite rightly said, it you need space for, for construction. We desperately as a council need, in fact, it's one of the biggest hurdles that we came across was the lack of skilled labour in our area when we're looking at future development. So in a way we'd be cutting off our nose to, to spite our face. In, in the longer term, if we support this proposal um, without a clear alternative uh, provision from, from the college. 
Um, the, the other aspect, though, which we haven't really discussed at all, and, I, and as a local uh, ward member, I totally uh, um, uh, do not support, is the design before us. I'd like, just, just take a look at that building, the barracks. Now, those barracks go back to before the Crimea War. They are historic asset to, to not only the, the town, but also to the district. Now, if you look at the plan, what they were going to put immediately next to those were the, in my view, I have to say it's a personal view, the blandest, ugliest, most basic housing design you could possibly come up with. There was no effort whatsoever to tie in with the historic character of that block next to it, immediately next to it, feet away from it. Now, if this was in Stamford, we discussed earlier, Corby Glen, we would not accept that design. And so I'm saying if we're looking at deferral, we should also be looking at materials that will be used in, 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 those, in those houses, even if the oval shape is kept the same. Um, I do think also that there is um, an issue regarding the uh, uh, street scene as well, which we haven't really touched on. If the topographical um, um, uh, information isn't there, it also means it's very difficult to assess the overall impact on our street scene. We do know that they're proposing to bring the line forward. Now, what they've been looking at is basically saying, well, this is better than a, a group of old college buildings, isn't it? But that's not what will be going in. It will be a permanent change. We're losing the asset. Those not, they're not just old college buildings. They're a valuable community asset. And secondly, if we did replace them, um, what we'd be looking at is enhancing under the conservation area rules, under our, all, our, all of our own um, local plan objectives, we should be seeking proactively to enhance the area, not to put in some bog standard um, block of housing as if this is not a conservation area. Now, a huge amount of work went into that. I have to declare an interest because I was involved in it. I know how much work went into it. Um, we've got Norman Lee's house, which is an arts and crafts house just around the corner as well. Our speaker earlier, I happen to know his property. I've done a visit uh, regarding a uh, professional matter before. Um, and uh, that's purely, I have to say, regarding a previous planning application, one behind. Um, and it in itself is a very beautiful uh, and lo lovely Victor Victorian building. The, these, uh, the character of these houses just simply does not reflect that. It will affect the street scene, which is directly opposite um, Margaret Thatcher's old school, which is of huge local interest as well, and is in itself actually very attractive, sort of Victorian style building. Um, this whole area has huge interest regarding World War I, Sandham Road itself, which it's sitting on, um, uh, was the border of the Harrowby camp, and the barracks was then used uh, by the Red Cross. Um, and th there is just no, by no, as a hospital for men who come back from the front line, that site is hugely important with regards to local history and even national history. And this, this presentation to us, there's absolutely no reflection of that. I, ca I cannot comment on the um, conservation officer. What I will say is they don't say it enhances the site. It merely is an improvement on the previous buildings. Not good enough. We only get one chance to get this right. So if we're taking it away for a deferral, Please, please, I need to look at even colour of the bricks, even a, a contrast in the bricks, anything at all that reflects the, the, the historic nature and the, win and the windows, how absolutely dire are they, given the historic character of the area? It, it looks like a 1970s development. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to come in, Emma? You were looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, all I was going to suggest is um, you've raised some um, very um, good and pertinent points, actually, Councillor Morgan. Um, and we'd, I've not heard um, design um, mentioned particularly thus far. So I think it would be slightly unreasonable for the applicants if we deferred it for further information to come back to only then raise other significant concerns. So if um, 
members would like to um, indulge the applicant in allowing them time to provide some of that information that we don't currently have, then I would suggest that you do you do consider whether you wish to um, include Councillor Morgan's suggestion of, of design in, in that deferment. Um, and then anything else, and he's got any really burning sort of issues about just so we're very clear. Um, the alternative, of course, is, is refusal um, on insufficient information, I would suggest, in terms of topographical um, impact and, uh, sorry, topographical details and lack of information to support um, under policy SP4, uh, SP6, sorry. Um, and there might be a couple of other issues, but obviously you'll need to make a decision whether you want to, to try the deferment first or not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, looking at the time, it shouldn't be an issue, but... Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I would like to give them the opportunity to answer a lot of the questions that have not been answered today, Madam Chairman, um, and I, I think that will be a reasonable thing to, to do. Um, so we're not being given all the facts. Um, to suggest that this is not fit for purpose, well, I can tell you, Madam Chairman, the reason why I know so much about this site is because I used to work on it, Madam Chairman. I used to work in this site a few years ago. I know exactly what they're all used for. I know how how important this is for the town. Um, so they'll have a job to pull the wool over the, my eyes, Madam Chairman, with with the, with with this facility. It's a, it's a wonderful asset for our town and for our youngsters. And uh, on a, on a hope, uh, well, I hope somebody sees sense at the end of the day, Madam Chairman. This is retained. I really do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Penny Milne. Do you want to make a quick comment? Um, well, yes, I, I concur with both sides of this argument. I think it's a double whammy, and um, I think we should look at it all. Um, I wouldn't be too happy in just picking one bit and then it comes back, but we weren't happy with something else. Um, I think um, if we were to refuse it, we should include DE1 and EN6. I think the design isn't appropriate there. Um, I mean, my view is you've got a conservation area, an important listed building for Grantham here. And um, OK, they're little commercial buildings, but they're set back, they're recessive, you don't see them. I didn't even know they were there. Um, this is going, going to be over-dominant. It's going to expose the frontage. It's uh, high. I think there's amenity for the historic environment and the residents around with that height and uh, there's no positive input from that and I think this less than substantial harm should be given significant weight in that on that basis and um, you combine that with the SP6 issues you know you've got significant um, challenge to the public benefits so um, whether we defer or go for a refusal those two sides should certainly be brought together quite agree with that, Councillor Penny Milnes. Councillor Jackie Smith, did you want to? Yes. Um, over the uh, years, the, um, uh, the buildings we're currently talking about were slowly used as uh, extra help to uh, the uh, KG and to uh, the King's School for additional education because there just wasn't space. It was always also used um, for um, children's, uh, particularly babies, uh, medical uh, work. Um, it was all sorts of things, um, and it's a change, almost nothing inside um, until a, a little while ago when it was just put to all sorts of uses. There's an enormous amount of history that has. has um, uh, has been already said that we ought to be looking at this. There have been lots of things that have been proposed that uh, the barracks should be used for, um, but uh, that's as far as it gets. Um, and it, as I said, it has been discussed over, over a lot of um, years that, um, you know, it wants to have something else to do with it. Um, it's... Uh, in some way, it's a, a, a bit strange that suddenly everybody wants to do something more with the, with the college instead of having done it a few years ago when it would have been much better. 
Thank you. Um, as it's my proposal for deferment has been seconded by numerous people. I would also like to include what Councillor Morgan said on the design um, and taken into account it is a conservation area. So um, if you're happy with that, um, I'd like to go to the vote. Yeah, and pennies. What? No, but take all that into account, please. We'd like further information, the topography, better design. Um, so with that in mind, for those in, um, in favour of deferment, can you please raise your hands? And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, we will now go on to the last item agenda. Yeah. Yeah, excuse me, Madam Chairman. I've, I've not been in for ever, ever so well this afternoon, so I'm, I'm going to call it today, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, Councillor Bellamy is leaving as well. Thank you. So we'll go to agenda item six, and uh, Chris Brown will be presenting his last application, which is very sad for all of us. So uh, thank you. And thank you, members of the public, for uh, waiting. Thank you. Sorry, we will have a five minute comfort break and then come back because uh, members want to get warm.
thank you. We'll take our seats. Lovely. Chris, go for it with your last presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, good evening, Planning Committee. Uh, the last item on the agenda is S21 forward slash 2286. Uh, the proposal is a new single storey dwelling with garaging for the proposed dwelling and for the existing number 22, the green. Uh, the proposal is an outline plan permission. The location is 22, the green at Thirlby. And uh, Miranda was the case officer and I'm Chris Brown. The key issues as part of this application are the principle of development, impact on the character and appearance of the area impact on highway safety, flooding and drainage, and impact on neighbouring land uses. For the site location plan, the site itself is shown in red. I appreciate that the red is quite faint on the screen there, but effectively the site is, is labelled as site and in the centre of your slide in front of you. The host dwelling number 22, the green, is outlined in blue at the top of the site. Uh, I'll come on to the proposed plan in a, in a second, but just to point out that the area shown as the... Um, uh, the hatched to the immediate east side, so to the west, uh, has plan permission for five dwellings. Work is underway, and I'll show you some pictures as well showing that development. Um, some, bit, some of it's partly constructed, some of it's still under construction. So moving on to the proposed block plan. So there you can see the, the host dwelling number 22 at the top of the site. The red line would bring an access to the east side of number 22. Uh, down the side of number 22 and then to the rear of the site into the existing rear garden of number 22. The proposed dwelling is shown there in the centre of your screen. I'll use the, you can see the mouse, so that is the proposed dwelling there. Um, as previously mentioned, this is an outline proposal, so this is an indicative layout. The proposed dwelling there in the centre of your screen is identified by the applicant as a single storey dwelling. In addition to the proposed dwelling, the application proposes demolition of a couple of outbuildings, which again I'll come on to and show in a picture, and proposes a new single, a new single garage building, um, but was subdivided to provide new garaging for the proposed dwelling number 22, uh, sorry, the proposed dwelling and the host dwelling number 22. That's shown just there if you can follow my cursor on the left hand side. Again, uh, as previously mentioned on the previous slide, all that, that hatching showed that uh, permission for five dwellings. That's now shown on this slide in turquoise. So everything's shown in turquoise on the right. There's the new dwelling uh, that's constructed. Again, I'll come onto a picture immediately to the front here. That replaces the previous number 23. And then the rest of the dwellings are under construction to the rear of the site, as shown down there, sort of going uh, off to the southeast of the, the plan on, on the slide there. So moving on to a satellite photo again, this shows the red line uh, of the site. It shows the existing buildings to be demolished. The, the note on the slide there, um, I don't know if anyone can read that on the screen, but effectively all it points out is something, I'll come on to the next picture, which shows the existing number 23 has since been demolished and rebuilt forward. So that's the existing 23, that's not there anymore. But this whole site here, which was previously shown in turquoise, being built out for further development. So this picture shows an up-to-date uh, snap of the, the site. So you, the new build dwelling number 23 is shown there on the left-hand side, if you can follow my mouse. So that's the new build dwelling there. This is the host dwelling straight in front of you. And the access to the new proposed dwelling would be again immediately in front of you. So it would go down the side of the host dwelling number 22. This is now a view uh, to the rear of the site, uh, taken from uh, number two old school close, which is located to the west of the site. So now, again, I use the, point, uh, the pointer to point out. So if you can see the pointer on the left-hand side, that red brick dwelling there, that's the host dwelling, number, 23, number 22. And again, you can see the stone dwelling, that's the newly constructed 23 on the far side of the site. In between the two, you can see these outbuildings here. So this existing outbuilding here and here, following the pointer, it's there to be demolished as part of this application. The new access would come down the side of number 22, where those outbuildings are, they would be demolished. And a new garage uh, to serve the host and the new dwelling uh, would be erected effectively right in the centre of there, so on this bit, centrally, where you can see the pointer. The new proposed dwelling is shown on the indicative block plan, just to the right-hand side, so there'd just be a glimpse visible, potentially of the front of it over on the right-hand side, but the vast majority of the dwelling would be just off that picture on the right-hand side there, in the rear garden of number 22. In terms of evaluation of the application, the principle of development is only acceptable providing it be in accordance with all the criteria set out in policy SP3 of the local plan, which is for infill development. Uh, 
In this case, the proposal is not considered to be in accordance with SP3A, as the land is not within substantially built up frontage or a redevelopment opportunity. Uh, this is something that has been um, backed up by the planning inspectors on a couple of recent appeals decisions that we've received, one in Market Deeping and one in Claypole. It is accepted that this application is otherwise compliant with policy SP3, so that's namely B, C and D there on your screens. Uh, County Highways have confirmed that highway impact is not considered to be severe, so there's no uh, highway impact considered. Uh, the proposal is therefore considered to be otherwise acceptable with SP3, uh, however it is in conf conflict with SP3A. The application is therefore recommended for refusal. The refusal reason is not there up on your slide, however it is in full on page 126 of the agenda. And just to read it out for clarification, it's the proposed development by virtue of its siting scale would not be within a substantially built up frontage or redevelopment opportunity, therefore failing to meet the criteria set out for infill development under local plan policy SP3 and policy TNP at 09 of the Thirlby neighbourhood plan. I, I won't read out the rest of it. Um, I'll hand back to you, thank you Chair. Thank you very much, Chris, for that presentation. Right, I'll call um, Stephen Holland. Thank you for your patience and waiting so long, bless your heart. Start when you're ready. The MPPF recognises. I'm oh, sorry. Next, next slide, please, Chris. The MPPF recognises the value of local distinctiveness and supports the use of characterisation studies such as character assessments to underpin and inform planning policy. The following extract is from the executive summary written by Andrew Ashcroft to uh, SKDC on the Thirlby Neighbourhood Plan. So I'll just read it out. The plan includes a range of policies and seeks to bring forward positive and sustainable development in the neighbourhood area. The plan is accompanied by an excellent character assessment. There is a clear focus on safeguarding local character and identifying the basis on which potential infill residential can take place. This particular site is in character area five. Next slide, please. Um, the focus, uh, which is the uh, character uh, area five, the green. The focus of one of the earliest settlements within the parish and the number of buildings from 1881 survive. Many of the more recent properties have sought to follow the established traditional building line. However, others, including the host property at number 22, the green have deviated from this approach with their frontages set back from the road behind larger front gardens. Next slide, please. The proposal would be contrary to paragraph 127 of the MPPF, which seeks a high standard of amenity for existing and future users. The fundamental issues are whether the development will accord with relevant local policies with regard to location, the effect of the development on the living conditions of future and existing occupiers of number two, uh, number 22 rather, regarding noise and disturbance with a shared driveway and the effect of future and existing occupiers of number two losing their rear garden amenity and privacy. Next slide please. The proposal for the single property to the rear of the established frontage on this particular part of the green between High Street and Station Road is out of character with the existing building line and would require a shared driveway with the host property. In addition, further amenity space would be taken up by the erection of substantial garaging to serve number 22, as well as the proposed dwelling with associated hard standing turning area and driveway. The current illustrative footprint of the proposed dwelling is unlikely to be suitable for a family dwelling and reserve matters may not be capable of creating a layout with satisfactory policy compliant living conditions and amenity space for future residents. Next slide, please. This is an outline planning application which is contrary to MPPF guidance and Thirlby Neighbourhood Plan Policy Objective PO2. The objective PO2 to ensure all new development, including extensions and renovations, are well designed and sympathetic to existing 30 form, seconds. scale and character of their location and appropriate to their immediate context with the character area described in the Thirlby and North and, uh, character assessment. This is the last, uh, the last paragraph. The application is contrary to Thirlby Neighbourhood Plan Policy TB09, new housing and in infill development, which results in the use of an unsuitable access, a reduction in privacy of adjacent properties, an increase in noise, fumes, and or pollution, and development will be inconsistent with the character and existing pattern of development. Thank you. Lovely. You did very well. Thank you. Um, and then we have Mark Ward, if you'd like to speak as well. Thank you. And uh, start when you're ready. Thank you.
Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak and express my views. Only recently, a previous application to develop the back garden of 22 The Green was refused on several grounds. Its impact on the character appearance of the area, its impact on neighbouring properties, it was considered a fundamental contravention of existing local plans and policies. In my view, the latest outline planning application does not address these points, and therefore I wish to strongly object to the development at 22 The Green. If I start by considering the development's impact on the character and appearance of this area, this latest outline proposal is still not in line with local plans and policies. Section SP3 clearly states that development must be within a substantially built up frontage or redeveloped opportunity, i.e. previously developed land. In this application, the dwelling and separate garage are in fact behind the built up frontage and the outline plan situates the proposed dwellings in the rear garden, land that has not been previously developed. SP3 also states that infill development must be within the main built up part of the settlement. The proposed development is clearly outside the main built up part of the settlement and to repeat on land that has never been developed. The development is therefore completely contrary to policy SP3 of the local plan. If this application is approved, it makes a complete nonsense of having villagers develop locally approved policies and plans. In my view, it's set a precedent for other developments to also ignore locally approved policies and plans. There will therefore be nothing to protect the village that could lead in time to the quintessential character of the village being destroyed. In terms of its impact on neighbouring properties, I love it, live in number two old school close, which is next to 22 The Green. In my view, this proposal still significantly impacts neighbouring properties. The output, the outline plan is to build a triple garage in a dwelling with a large footprint onto the applicant's existing garden. The rear of our house is orientated towards the proposed dwelling, and this, along with the position of the proposed triple gar garage, will dramatically reduce light coming into our kitchen study and two of our upstairs bedrooms and will severely impact our privacy. The outline plan is proposing parking space for eight vehicles, clearly turning what is currently a garden, garden into a busy parking and turning space for several cars, going to, which is going to have a detrimental impact, not only on the outlook for my property, but also the enjoyment of my property with anticipated increase in noise and pollution associated with this number of vehicles. A lot of time and energy has been invested by representatives of the local community and other stakeholders in preparing the Fell B neighbourhood plan to ensure alignment of policies with national and South Coast even planning policies. This policy and plans are critical if the character of Fell is protected and should be protected and upheld. I therefore strongly believe that this development should be rejected, not only for the benefit of residents situated next to 22 The Green, but also to uphold the current policies and plans for the benefit of Thelby's current and future residents. Lovely, thank you very thank much. You. Um, could you just turn the mic off, please? Lovely, thank you. Councillor Morgan. Oh, did you want to ask a question? Yes, certainly. Do you want to just go back? Thank you. Um, you mentioned um, the impact on your your property and the loss of um, potential loss of light and shadow, etc. Um, it was a bit difficult to tell. Do we have an illustration that we that we so we can see uh, um, appreciate the relationship between our speaker's property and the dis the new development? Looking. Sorry. So the pointer is your property twin. Is that correct? Can you just talk it off that one there? Could you just talk us through that, please? Yeah, certainly. So where the house is on the front look north, we have uh, a window facing north, which was blocked by the garage at this stage we don't know how big that garage is, is going to be so that that will certainly block the light coming in from the from the north and the east and then we have windows which i guess they, they face the 
end of our house, it's going to straight out onto the bungalow. So we're going to have light from both not from the garage, but also from the from the bungalow, which would be you know, when the sun comes up on that side, mm -hmm. you're going to have a, 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 a bungalow with, with I guess a, a roof in it, which is a block light. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Thank you very much then. And we'll have questions to the officer. Do I have any? No. Well, I'll make a proposal that we go then, if nobody's got any questions, that we go with the officer's recommendation for refusal. Yeah, thank you. And we'll go for the vote then as that's been seconded. And that's unanimous. Thank you very much. That has been refused. Thank you. And uh, I close the meeting at 5.17.